All right, if I go ahead and have your attention, please. Thank you. On behalf of the International Coalition of Abolition Societies, I would like to officially welcome you to this evening's debate. Uh, my name is Matt Bodenhammer, and I am the president of the aforementioned organization, which is also known by the much shorter name of ICAS. Uh, it's an honor and privilege to be able to host this debate tonight, and we thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, before I get started with uh, introducing the debate and our speakers, I'd like to make a few comments about uh, noise in the room. Uh, if at all possible, it would uh, be greatly appreciated if you keep uh, noise and conversation to a minimum. Uh, we are uh, trying to live stream this debate and any noise from the audience uh, will get picked up by that and be potentially distracting. Um, if you have uh, children uh, begin to make noise, we just ask that you uh, take them outside and we would appreciate that. And also if you have cell phones, please place them, uh, or turn them off or put them in airport mode at this airplane mode at this time. Okay, the question of tonight's debate is the following. Uh, should those seeking an end to abortion rally together and focus on incremental victories and gradual abolition? Or should they rally together and focus on total and immediate abolition? This is a question that we believe is vitally important for all Christians to consider. Uh, for it has far reaching implications for how we live our lives uh, in obedience to the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ, particularly in relation to the wanton and legalized slaughter of those who bear his image. It is our hope and prayer tonight that this debate will serve to provide you with both information and arguments that will enable you to better address this own issue in your own hearts and minds. And furthermore, it is our hope and prayer that this debate will ultimately help you in your efforts to oppose the institution of abortion in a way that is both biblical and honoring to Christ. At this time, I would like to take a few minutes to introduce our speakers. Our moderator for tonight's debate is Dr. Chris Burba. Chris is currently an associate professor of chemistry at Northeastern State University in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. He earned his Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from NSU and his PhD in Chemistry from the University of Oklahoma. He is an author of nearly 30 peer-reviewed scientific publications, primarily in the area of lithium ion batteries and other energy storage materials. On behalf of ICAST, we are, much great, we are most grateful to have Chris here with us this evening to serve as moderator for this debate. Next, our first speaker tonight in tonight's debate is T. Russell Hunter. Russ is a good friend, a dear brother in Christ, and well, uh, as he didn't exactly have an up-to-date biographical introduction on hand, he asked me to say a few words about it myself, which is something that I am uh, more than happy to do. Uh, in my own words, I would say that Russ is, uh, most simply put, a Christian, a Christian who is seeking to be faithful in the midst of a culture that kills his children, and a Christian who is currently serving his Lord in, full, in the capacity of a full-time abolitionist. Russ has a BA in philosophy and an MA in the history of science from the University of Oklahoma, as well as a nearly completed doctorate in history of science from the same institution. Uh, Russ founded the Abolition Society of Oklahoma in early 2011, and uh, putting his academic labors on hold has worked tirelessly to build up the grassroots abolitionist movement that he's been so instrumental in forming. Through his numerous writings and conference talks, through his artwork and true propaganda, and through countless conversations with abolitionists across the country, Russ has played a crucial role in the reignition and advancement of the modern abolitionist movement. Russ is a tireless worker who is devoted to his family, to the body of believers of which he is a part, and to the cause of Christ, his king. There are many more things that I could say about Russ, but I think he would prefer that I just get on with the debate. So that I will do. Our second speaker in tonight's debate is Greg Cunningham. Uh, Greg is the executive director of the Center for Bioethical Reform. He earned a BA degree from the Pennsylvania State University and a JD degree from the Ohio Northern University School of Law, where he served as executive editor of the Law Review. He is co-author of a handbook on attorney misconduct entitled Ethics and Discipline in Ohio, which was published by the Ohio State Bar Foundation in 1976. 
He is a former two-term member of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, where he introduced legislation which ended public f funding for abortion. He was also a prime sponsor of the Abortion Control Act, which was litigated before the United States Supreme Court and Thornburg v. the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. He later helped direct the ballot initiative campaign, which stopped public funding for abortion in Colorado. During the first Reagan administration, he served as a political appointee in the U.S. Department of Education, and later in the Office of Legislative Affairs with the U.S. Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. He next served as a Special Assistant U.S. Attorney for Los Angeles. Uh, Greg is a US re uh, retired U.S. Air Force Reserve Colonel with six years of active duty service and 25 years in the Ready Reserve. He is also a decorated veteran of the Vietnam War. Uh, please join me in a round of applause to welcome our speakers tonight. All right, at this time, our moderator, uh, Dr. Burba, will explain the rules and format of tonight's debate. Following his remarks, the debate will commence with the opening statement of T. Russell Hunter. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. So our debate is going to start with 20-minute opening statements. And this is going to begin with Russ uh, arguing in favor of, of immediatism and it will be followed by Greg arguing in favor of incrementalism. There will then be 15 minute rebuttals uh, in the same order, and, uh, and then there will be 15 minutes for cross-examination. So each person will have 15 minutes to ask questions to the other person. This will be uh, finished with five minutes of closing statements, and then we'll allow 35 minutes for audience questions. So uh, I would like to remind the audience to please hold your applause till the end. Um, and, and as was asked at the beginning, uh, this is being live streamed. And I was told that the, the microphones are very sensitive. So if you're wanting to have a conversation with your neighbor, uh, just be aware that it might be picked up and streamed over the internet. So um, you might want to be quiet or if you need to maybe step outside, especially if you have children who are, who are getting antsy. So at, at this time, we'll go ahead and begin with Russ, and he'll have 20 minutes to make his opening presentation. All right. Thanks for coming, you guys. Thanks for uh, being out in the field and doing activism all day and then coming into a debate. That's awesome. You're all awesome. Um, the primary aim of uh, at least the opening remarks of uh, the debate tonight for myself are pretty simple. Um, I want to explain what immediatism is. I just want to, 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 to define it properly, rightly. So much of the debate about immediatism has been hijacked by various straw man representations of it or just not thinking about it in the sense of the terms that we actually give it. Thinking immediatism is simply anti-incrementalism when it's more than that, or equating immediatism with something like overnightism or absolutism or idealism or perfectionism or something like that. But the debate between incrementalism and immediatism in the way that I see it uh, is, is really an old one. Uh, it goes back, it's as old as the enmity between the woman and the snake uh, it's a debate between God has said and did God really say. So when I speak of immediatism and incrementalism, it is within this framework. But I will begin with, you know, some good old classic definitions. Uh, the Oxford English Dictionary defines immediatism as the principle or practice of immediate action, and it brings up the abolition of slavery as an example. Uh, the definition is not very helpful when it's got words like principle and practice of that need to be defined, but it is good in the usage. You see that it's the opposite of gradualism. Very clear, sure. Uh, also, when, when it's being spoken about, it's the doctrine of immediatism oftentimes, and has been since its inception, um, since it was coined in the 30s or a little before then. 
the OED defines an immediate test as one who practices or advocates immediate action. And you get uh, in the usages of the words that the OED provides, uh, immediate tests were deprecated as uh, the imprudent measures of immediate tests were deprecated uh, by anti-slavery gradualists because there were people who opposed slavery when immediatism was born who were not themselves immediatist but were opponents of immediatism. But helpful in the definition, you have the use of the gospel of the immediatist. And the gospel of the immediatist in the reference work was work while the day lasts. That's helpful in that it makes a clear point that immediatism, even though the word sound immediate, doesn't necessarily mean happening overnight. It means working while the day lasts. But what is the practice? What is the principle? And um, primarily and most importantly, what is immediate action? As I said, the definitions, they, uh, they don't give us enough that we need, but they do at least refute at least one straw man that we hear over and over and over and over again on the internet, that immediatism is just overnightism and a means to sell shirts. Um, of course, it's not that. Um, as a historian, um, I was trained to actually define a word, especially a word like this, by looking at the people who coined it and used it and the people that it was attached to. So I'm going to begin real quickly. This is going to be very fast, but I'm going to look at the American abolitionist. You know, the first street preachers in the United States of America. The American abolitionists were called immediatist because, in, as they stated in their, de- in their declaration, they believed that the slaves ought instantly to be set free and brought under the protection of law. That all those laws which are now in force admitting the right of slavery are before God utterly null and void that they are presumptuous transgressions of all the holy commandments and that therefore they ought to be instantly abrogated. This was their doctrine. This is their belief. But just, just in case you think, well, immediatist and incrementalist all agree that, that slavery ought to be abolished or abortion ought to be abolished, right? That it ought, that it ought to be undone. The immediatists were very clear from the same Declaration of Sentiments, they wrote that they regarded as delusive, cruel, and dangerous any scheme which pretended to aid, either directly or indirectly, in the emancipation of the slaves, or that was a substitute for the immediate and total abolition of slavery. So the immediatist was committed not only to ending slavery, no matter how long it took, but all along the way to ending slavery, to never at any moment substitute an incremental scheme which prolonged its continuation. This is the defining characteristic of the immediatist in in this uh, strategic sense. Um, Writing of the immediatist, one of the first historians, Oliver, Timothy Oliver, said that it was the doctrine of immediate emancipation that imbued the abolitionist with their strength and that made all the difference between success and failure. The primary reason that they held this view and that was riddled throughout all of their writings, all of their propaganda, all their posters, uh, their Facebook memes prior to Facebook, was the simple, pure belief and statement that slavery is sin, national sin. This was their creed. And because it was sin, and because most people in the country were willing to at least acknowledge that, if not proclaim it, they said that the nation was bound to repent instantly. If the nation knows it's sin, the nation must be called to repent. So when they talked about the spirit of abolitionism or the principle of immediate action in abolitionism, they said the abolition of slavery by the spirit of repentance. So William Lloyd Garrison, who we all know is one of the principal immediatists of this period uh, and, and the publisher of The Liberator, made this very clear and uh, I'll leave this up here, but I'm going to read this. Wendell Phillips is a Calvinist minister who was speaking a eulogy at his uh, uh, um, funeral. S- says of Garrison, 
that he seems to have understood that righteousness is the only thing that will finally compel submission, that only by the most absolute assertion of the uttermost truth, without qualification or compromise, can a nation be waked to conscience or strengthened for duty. He said that Garrison seems to be born that way. Like born in the knowledge that the only way to abolish slavery is to demand a immediate and total repentance without qualification or compromise. Well, Phillips was being nice at the funeral. The, the, the truth of the matter was that, um, I'm going to th go through these slides, Garrison was not always an immediatist. In 1829, Garrison was standing up in front of uh, the pro-life movement of his day, proposing and arguing for the gradual abolition of slavery, saying slavery must be torn down brick by brick, and making arguments for colonization, compensated man uh, manumission, and all this sort of thing. But it was when Garrison looked at the slave auctions and saw a mother's child being ripped from her arms, when Garrison started reading George Bourne and Lemuel Haynes, John Wesley, and he started thinking about the doctrine of sin. He said, how can I suffer to have this around for any moment? And being convinced of the gospel, he said, if the gospel is designed to destroy something like slavery, it must be immediately abandoned. So in 18... Uh, 31, he had to publish a recant of his former incrementalism, explain that he, he was wrong and, and make a full, you know, he says, I seize the opportunity to make a full unequivocal uh, re recantation. Now, Garrison is the most famous immediatist. We all know him. We like him because he's very, you know, uncompromising as justice and harsh as truth. But he was, um, he was not the first to uh, be an immediatist or propose it. He was just kind of the loudest. The doctrine of immediatism had its first full treatment in the works of Elizabeth Hyrick, a British abolitionist of slavery, who in 1824 published her pamphlet, Immediate Not Gradual Abolition. Why was that? Why did she have to publish that? Because 17 years after the abolition of the slave trade, they were still practicing slavery in all the West Indian colonies. Slavery still continued in the United States of America. And anyone who was trying to do a boycott or a petition and was saying, we've got to do something about slavery, kept on being squelched by, we're going for the gradual abolition of slavery. So she had to write her pamphlet, Immediate Not Gradual Abolition, to explain that everyone had been derailed and needed to get back on track. The reason I say get back on track, I know you guys can't read all that, I'm just saying that Everything I'm saying is from primary source material, and you can go look at it. To get back on track, we have to go back to the original immediatist abolitionist who started the work of abolishing slavery. And I'll just look at, real quick, very quickly, uh, William Wilberforce. Oftentimes, pro-lifers use Wilberforce as some kind of a champion for incrementalism. And I guarantee you that might be a separate debate on that, but that is absolutely horrid and ridiculous. Um, Wilberforce, like Garrison, had to repent of his own apathy, of his own indifference, of his own playboy lifestyle in the midst of a culture that was practicing slavery. And whenever he stood up in 1789, gave his first speech on behalf of the abolition of the slave trade, he admitted that they were guilty, that the nation needed to repent before God, and that it was a shame that they were practicing this trade. He stated that it is not regulation, it is not palliatives that can cure this enormous evil. Total abolition is the only possible cure. It is very clear in the works of William Wilberforce. And this is immediatism. 1791, he introduces his first of many parliamentary bills. It is soundly defeated. And in 1792, he's going to go back. He's an immediatist. He's not going to wait five more years to put forward another bill. He goes back the following year proposing the abolition bill. And this time, 
He writes in, in his opening statements, my conviction of the indispensable necessity of immediately stopping the slave trade. He moved a lot of people in the house. A lot of people were very impressed. But this is where the debate between immediatism and gradualism begins. If many of you have seen the movie Amazing Grace, there's a famous scene that captures this. But after Wilberforce gives his rousing speech, rousing speech against uh, slave, the slave trade, uh, the right honorable friend Henry Dundas stands up and says, Well, I am for the abolition of the slave trade, but it must be done gradually. And with that, Parliament listened to Dundas. Dundas spoke also of how evil slavery was, how, yes, he agrees that it ought to be ended quickly. Yes, he thought it was inhuman and unjust and all this kind of stuff. William Dalbin, a regulationist abolitionist who had proposed a bill earlier, stood up and agreed. But there was a lot of sense to the idea that we just could not move towards an immediate abolition of the trade. What we had to do was focus on getting things in order. Yes, immediatism would be the best, but it just was not practicable. William Pitt, uh, the Sherlock Holmes character in um, Amazing Grace, stood up after uh, Wilberforce gave his immediate bill, and stood before, and he said, why ought the slave trade be abolished? Because it's incurable injustice. How much stronger, then, is the argument for immediate than gradual abolition? By allowing it to continue even for one hour, do not my right honorable friends weaken do not they desert their own argument of its injustice? If on the ground of injustice it ought to be abolished at last, why ought it not now? Why is this injustice to be suffered to remain for a single hour? If, as Dundas and Dolben and various MPs had said that it is unjust, why? Why not abolish it? If it's sin, let's get rid of it. Well, House took a vote and they accepted the insertion of gradual, and they passed a gradual bill of abolition. And as we know from watching uh, the news, those actually never do go anywhere. So abolition was defeated. Thomas Clarkson writes in his history of the slave trade abolition that it was a resolution among the abolitionists at that time. They went home and they said, wow, this is the enemy. This is gradual abolition is the enemy. And they resolved themselves to immediate abolition. But Wilberforce pressed on. Most of the people in his uh, community became incrementalist, full-blown gradual abolitionist, and he pressed on and he started putting forward a bill every session. And um, uh, outside of whenever the French war broke out, he did not. But in 1807, finally, after tireless work, they passed a bill of abolition of the slave trade, and it was immediate and complete, not gradual in its operation. 1807. Now, as we've already looked, Elizabeth Hyrick points out the fact that they made a very gross injustice and error, and that they did not apply the same immediatist action to the slave, the practice of slavery itself. But history was a tutor. And uh, I'm reading from, this is a historian of Congress, and he's, he's writing in a book, and he's covering the English abolitionist, and uh, he says, as Martin Luther King and his cohorts fighting against racial segregation in the 20th century had had repeatedly to explain why we can't wait, the title of one of his books, so in the previous century, the English abolitionist, in their long struggle, had come to see that they had to say immediately, because anything gradual stretched out into never. If you were serious about ending slavery, history had shown you had to cut through that endless self-deceiving delay. And as many of us know, uh, King himself was a diehard immediatist, and his principal opponents were incremental abolitionists who said, we agree with you that civil rights must be brought to bear, but uh, they must be done gradually by increments and get the best you can. 
and uh, that's why we got the letter um, from Birmingham Jail. So history basically has shown by this point, through these men and their work, men and women, that the time for justice is always now. Any justice delayed goes out, yes, amen, it goes out till never. But these are not the first immediatists, okay? I'm going to go pretty fast here. I'm running a little behind, but the call for immediate abolition, national repentance, does not have its origin in William Wilberforce or Martin Luther King or anyone like this. It is on the lips of every single prophet of God. The doctrine of immediatism is stated in its most pure and undefiled form in the words of Isaiah when he said, wash yourselves Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. The way these guys spoke to their cultures was about removing, ceasing, correcting, cleaning. It was stop with your idolatry. Tear down your high places. Stop killing children. It wasn't Let's shut down some of the high places and change the way that we, instead of throwing them in a fire to Moloch, let's uh, burn them with some kind of chemical. It was all of it. We could look at Jeremiah. We could look at Amos. We could look at Ezekiel. We could look at Jonah. The prophets of God stood. They were confident. And they said, we must repent and turn to God. Why? Because God's law was clear. It was absolute. You could not moderate it. God's law said, thou shalt not murder. In regards to slavery, it said, whoever steals a man and sells him and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. You shall not follow the masses in doing evil, nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after a multitude in order to pervert justice. So the prophets knew that you could not slacken the law of God at all. If all the people in your culture said, listen, we get the whole thou shalt not murder thing, but we think in the case of rape, it's cool. If you go with the multitude, you are a perverter of justice. And woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Woe to those who make unjust laws. Law, this is laws within the law of God, who make decrees, which, if you look at it, withhold justice who do they withhold justice for? The fatherless. We're talking children who don't have fathers. I'm out of time, so I'm going to have to like end it here and pick it up in a subsequent uh, part of the rebuttal. But of course, this goes back to Pharaoh and Moses, the most clear exposition of the doctrine of immediatism in its contrast with incrementalism comes from Pharaoh saying, how about I let your people go for a few days? How about... I, you can take, but you got to leave your little children. How about you leave the animals? And Moses says, let my people go. All the animals, not a single hoof. Would that pro-lifers today care as much about That's free-born timeless. children as the Hebrew animals? Thank you. At this time, Mr. Cunningham will give his opening remarks. For those of you who are not acquainted with the Center for Bioethical Reform, uh, we, we uh, oppose abortion from the moment of fertilization all the way through full-term delivery. We are absolutists. We don't compromise on that point. We are moral immediatists but we are strategic and tactical incrementalists. Not because we want to be, but because we must be. And the logical flaw in my friend T. Russell's analysis, if I may be so bold, is that he presupposes that the pro-life movement has the power to end abortion right now and we just choose to not do it because we don't care about the babies. And I came here today to say to you that we save every baby by passing every law that, that the courts and the culture will allow us 
to pass. And while we're doing that, we're working. Russell, whom I like and respect and admire, has posted um, a number of statements that are simply factually incorrect. And I'm going to try to clarify some of those factual misstatements. He says the pro-life movement is losing the abortion battle. That, that is a factually incorrect statement. Uh, in, in, in addition to saying, and, or not only intimating, but saying that, 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 that we're eager to compromise, that we're satisfied with the status quo, that we don't have any difficulty with, uh, with allowing some abortions to take place, as though we have power over which abortions take place. Uh, he says this whole thing is an exercise in futility, the only solution is what I call the magic wand solution. You sort of wave a magic wand and, and abortion goes away. Now he would say no, it's a miraculous solution because we pray to God. And that's another problem with Russell's approach. He suggests that he's the only one praying, that we're not praying, that the pro-life movement doesn't pray. The difference is we pray and work to pass every bill every law that will save every baby that the courts and the culture will allow us to save at that moment. We don't do the one or the other, we do both. I, I have with me, and we're gonna post a lot of this so you can read these documents yourself, you don't have to take my word for any of this. Professor Michael New very recently published a very sophisticated peer-reviewed study of the post-Casey decision uh, state legislative restrictions on abortion that have been passed since the Casey decision uh, in the 1980s, post-Casey era. And he discovered, and again, you can read the study, that the legislation that is being passed all over the country at the state level to restrict abortion, to regulate abortion, the things that Russell doesn't like, regulate abortion, are saving babies' lives, that the abortion rate is falling in all of the states in which there are funding cutoffs, in all of the states in which there are parental involvement requirements, in all of the states in which there are informed consent requirements, those babies' lives are being saved. I came here today to say to you, I care about that. I care about those babies. I'm not just gonna let those babies die. We can save those babies en route to abolishing abortion. I want to abolish abortion, and I'm working to do that. But en route to that goal, I'm going to save every baby I can. I'm not going to step back and say, oh, no, that's, that's incrementalism. And we're not incrementalists. We are immediatists. I'm going to come back to this state legislative thing, and the reason I'm going to come back to it is because, and I, I don't say this immodestly, and if you'll forgive a personal reference, the Casey decision by, by the U.S. Supreme Court that is the model for all of this legislation was based on the Thornburg decision uh, just two years earlier in, in the Pennsylvania State Legislature where I served, and I was a prime sponsor of the bill, the Omnibus Abortion Control Act that got litigated in Thornburg. And I have a stack of newspaper articles with me that I haven't looked at in 35 years. And I, I only pulled them out because Russell said that, that we're eager to compromise. Uh, and the beef against me when I was a state legislator was that I wouldn't compromise, that I was constantly pushing everybody, holding their feet to the fire, demanding the toughest bills that we'd possibly get. And many of my colleagues showed tremendous courage and heroism doing exactly the same thing, to save every baby's life that could possibly be saved. Very painful for me to hear Russell belittling those men and women and, and their courage, some of, them, some of whom lost their seats over that effort, when now the political scientists are telling us that babies' lives 
or being saved as a consequence of all of that. The legislation that I am talking about started off as a clean bill. And if I could have the next slide. Oh, it, it just hang on. Let's, let's leave this slide up for just a second. Uh, R R Russell has posted that the pro-life movement is sort of downplaying the fact that you're going to be able to buy, uh, can buy Plan B in, in grocery stores now. We, we will be using this sign outside of grocery stores to, to attempt to drive customers away uh, using this blastocyst, this uh, few-day-old embryo uh, picture in conjunction with these abortion pictures to make the point that abortion is wrong at all ages, all methods. It doesn't matter. It's, it's all wrong. We're not going to treat these individually when we're educating the public and, and conducting boycotts. We're going to be linking them together because we see continuity in human life because we are absolutists morally, but where we're forced to be incrementalist strategically, uh, that's what we're going to do. Next slide, please. We are totally against abortion where rape is claimed. And we use this sign on university campuses. Millions of students have seen it uh, to, to emphasize how, how much like honor killing conceptually these kinds of abortions actually are. I started out with the bill that I introduced that, that would become the legislation that was litigated in the Thornburg decision and then was amended after I had left the legislature and relitigated again in Casey. And so I speak authoritatively when, when I talk about this legislative stuff because I helped draft the bills. I started off with a bill that had no rape exception in it. And if, you're, if you don't remember anything else I say today, I want you to get this. No rape exception, because I was totally against that. But Russell, I put one in. You know why I put it in? I put it in because I can count. And I had whip counts, and I had test votes, and I realized very quickly that I didn't have the votes to keep it out. And so then the question became, whose rape exception would go in? Would it be my very narrow rape exception? Or would, would it be Planned Parenthood's very broad rape exception? And I knew that if I put my narrowly drawn rape exception in, I could defeat Planned Parenthood's rape exception. Now, I could have done what I hear some immediatists do, and I could have said, I'm going to be righteous. I'm going to be holier than thou. And I'm going to just step back and say, no rape exception for me because I'm an abolitionist. I'm, I'm an immediatist. I'm not some kind of incrementalist. But I didn't do that. I introduced the toughest, narrowest rape exception I could with reporting requirements that had very stringent time limits on them. Years later, I checked with the Pennsylvania Department of Health, not one single abortion had been funded by the state pursuant to a claim of rape. But I guarantee you there would have been if I would have let the Planned Parenthood amendment go in. Now, lots of pro-lifers denounced me as a compromiser. They said the guy sold out. He told us he was against rape. And then what do you know? He puts a rape exception in. I put the rape exception in to save babies' lives. And it did. Praise God that it did. So when, again, when we talk about, it's, it's very easy at these conferences and sitting in your pajamas late at night posting angry Facebook grants. It's easy to be an immediatist, an abolitionist, but when you're actually standing there and it's your responsibility, very different situation because we're all going to stand before God and give an accounting for whether we could have saved that baby's life or not. Now, because my, my time is running out, uh, if you could give me the next slide here. We, we, uh, we recognize, as all great social reform activists have recognized throughout the centuries, 
that, that these kinds of atrocities, whether it's slavery or abortion or whatever, have two dimensions. They have a secular dimension and they have a spiritual dimension and both need to be addressed. There's a human rights element to this and, and for people with, for whom social justice arguments resonate, you better be able to make a social justice argument. And for people with whom a spiritual argument will resonate, you better talk about abortion as a sin because it is a sin. And in, in, a, in, in an appropriate forum, we talk about abortion as a sin and invoke all of the scriptural principles that we all know. And when we're talking in a social justice forum, we talk about uh, abortion as a human rights violation. We don't talk Greek to the Romans. We don't talk Romans to the Greek. But when we're on a university campus, <clears throat> sometimes abolitionists make it sound as though they're the only ones who preach the gospel. We always try to work with campus ministry groups to make sure the gospel is being shared every place we have these signs. And lots of students who see these pictures that are sort of ambivalent about God decide they're okay with God if, if there is a God, because after all, they haven't killed anybody. And then they see the pictures, and they're post-abortive, and they think, well, maybe I have killed somebody. And we've had many campus ministry leaders tell us that these pictures ha have created an environment in which people who didn't feel lost suddenly do. People who didn't feel estranged from God suddenly do. And now there's an opportunity to share the gospel. We want to make sure they hear that gospel. We're not binary. It's not, well, we're going to do the social justice argument or we're going to do the spiritual argument. We do both for heaven's sake because we don't want that girl who's an atheist standing there pregnant who has an abortion appointment made. We don't want her to say, oh, uh, pro-life, that's a Christian thing. I'm not Christian, so I guess it must be okay for me to kill my baby. When perhaps if we would have made a social justice argument to her, we would have saved her baby's life. Now, we can be self-righteous and sort of puff ourselves up and say, you know, we're, we're only going to preach the gospel. We do both. We do both because there are two aspects to this issue. Next slide, please. We were the first to fight at the uh, uh, University of California at Irvine, the stem cell harvesting research they, they were doing there, we confronted the guys who directed that program to make the point that the baby is a baby from the first moment of fertilization all the way through full-term delivery, all of that continuity. We fought that. Even though we don't have the power to stop it, we teach that it's wrong. And it, again, we emphasize that we are God's image bearers at the same time we're emphasizing the social justice aspect of this. Is there one more slide or is that it? Um, we, we also inveigh against abortion uh, to terminate pregnancies that involve uh, any sort of prenatal defect, uh, birth defect. That happens to be my daughter. Uh, okay, next slide. It doesn't matter what the defect, it, these are God's children, they're our brothers and sisters and we need to defend them, and, and we do. Next slide. Even, of course, abortions based on gender. Now, R Russell made some statements about William Wilberforce that are simply factually inaccurate. William Wilberforce was a moral absolutist, a moral immediatist, but he was a strategic and tactical incrementalist. The very fact that William Wilberforce started out fighting the slave trade, not slavery, is a function of the fact, folks. He didn't have the votes, and he could count. He knew he didn't have the votes, and so he went after what he thought he could get, and that was the slave trade, and while he was doing that, he supported legislation that redesigned, forced a redesign of the slave ships. Just as Texas recently, and, and Russ dissed this, he, 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 he belittled it, Texas is saving babies' lives by requiring abortion clinics to be redesigned in exactly the same way 
Wilberforce and the abolitionists supported legislation to require slave ships to be redesigned, and they made arguments related to uh, pain among the slaves, pain and suffering, as well as the lives of the slaves. They said, well, we can't end the slave trade. Let's at least try to mitigate some of the pain and suffering. And that was an incredibly shrewd thing to do because in that era, when, when black people, when surgery was performed on black people, they weren't given anesthesia. You know why? It was assumed they couldn't feel pain because it was assumed that they were subhuman. And just getting people to think about the fact that black people could feel pain, that they could suffer, went a long way toward convincing the British people that these were human beings entitled to rights of personhood, which is exactly the same thing we do with this pain-capable legislation. Historically, people associate uh, the ability to register pain with humanity and entitlement to rights of personhood. Russ talks this down. I mean, he, just, he goes way out of his way to talk down the pain-capable legislation as well as out of his way to talk down uh, the requirements that abortion be regulated through abortion clinic design. His argument isn't with me, it's with William Wilberforce. I love Russ. Russ loves William Wilberforce so much. Have you ever said, is anybody here, show of hands, do you know what Russ's email address is? Two great objects, William Wilberforce, and William Wilberforce supported slave ship design. That's an incremental deal. And William Wilberforce also supported legislation that banned slave traffic from, uh, from foreign ports, limiting slave traffic so it could only be uh, involved British ports. Again, incremental, totally incremental. William Wilberforce's last speech to Parliament spoke in favor of compensating slave owners for the emancipation of their slaves. And he was annihilated by other abolitionists for that. He was seen as a, a sellout, a compromise kind of guy. You know why he did it? And Russ talked it down three or four times in his presentation, compensating slave owners. We don't do that. We're abolitionists, immediate, blah, blah, blah. Wilberforce did it because he didn't have the votes. He knew that he had to do it to get the votes. And, and now we weren't talking about the, the abolition of the slave trade. We were talking about the abolition of slavery. And to get the votes, he said, okay, we will compensate the slave owners. I don't mind Russ disagreeing with all of this, but don't say it didn't happen. Don't claim people like William Wilberforce as immediatists when he was not an immediatist from a strategic and tactical point of view. He was absolutely an immediatist as I am from a moral point of view. But Russ is confusing those two things. Abraham Lincoln, some of you may, may not be aware of the fact, Abraham Lincoln had the Emancipation Proclamation on his desk for months while slaves were dying and he didn't issue it because public opinion wouldn't support it. He was waiting for victories on the battlefield that would give him the political momentum he needed to build a consensus that the Emancipation Proclamation should be issued. And then when he did, finally did issue it, it only freed the slaves in the Confederate states. It didn't free the slaves in the border states. Why? Because tactically and strategically, he was afraid that if he freed the slaves in the border states, they would lead, they would secede. They Break, would, that's time. They, they, would, they would go to the Confederacy. Russ hails, and rightly so, Abraham Lincoln is the great emancipator. Abraham Lincoln was an incrementalist and a compromiser because he knew when he had the votes and he knew when he didn't. Thank you. It's so tempting to talk about William Wilberforce uh, and make the whole debate about that, but I don't want to. Um, Wilberforce never authored these bills that he's talking about. Um, Supported them at some point, sometimes maybe voting, maybe a nod, uh, sometimes ridiculing them, oftentimes publishing regret about them. 
And in the end, as far as the compensation things go, uh, actually signed a protest written by William Lloyd Garrison, who met with him, where Wilberforce repented of his sin. That's what I love about Wilberforce. He was a man who repented of sin. I didn't ever say William Wilberforce was perfect. And I certainly didn't say that he was always in, in every way an immediatist. I said that the lesson of history teaches us that we cannot compromise with sin, that we must call for national repentance. And if we don't call for national repentance, we'll never change the culture to where someone like Lincoln can publish a Emancipation Proclamation. And of course, as many of us know, Lincoln credited the Garrisonian abolitionists and what they called and cried as that which made it possible. Um, but uh, the, the opening remarks were just to define immediatism in its historical context, in the stri scriptural context. Uh, but I'm going to apply it to abortion. But I want to point out the fact that Greg didn't talk about immediatism and that component of immediatism that is calling for repentance, treating slavery, abortion, whatever it is, as national sin, and, and saying to the country, this must be stopped, the spiritual side. When he talked about going on campuses and sure there's an occasion to share the gospel or something like that, for abolitionists of slavery, immediatists, there is no talking about abortion in a way that it's not a spiritual issue. Secular people need to hear that abortion is sin also. They need to be shared the gospel. You don't say, you don't survey your people and say, are you secular or are you sacred? And they say, oh, I'm sacred. And they're like, okay, well, I'm going to keep this a human rights thing. You talk about sin because it's their sin and their hatred of God and their disbelief in God which leads them to abortion. So to do that, I think, is a terrible, terrible error. And also to survey your crowd and say something like, well, I can't pass this unless I sell out the fatherless, is writing an iniquitous decree to pervert justice. And I've looked at Greg's record, and they are still uh, aborting children there and uh, killing image bearers of the living God and my neighbors, but no funding is provided for them. Let me just start back where I was at, just real quick. Um, Greg said uh, something about magic wands or something like that, and we don't have the power. Actually, I think we do. We actually do, and this is the main thing that's wrong with incrementalism. Someone might say, we're not like Moses, we're not like Isaiah, we don't have the power. We're more powerful, far more powerful. We've got a risen king, right, who entered the world through a womb of a young unmarried woman, came, set up a church, died, rose from death, abolishing death, and set up a people. And he said to the people, hey, I'm sending you out with a commission. And don't worry, I'm going to be with you. And I'm going to provide you with a helper. And then you'll have my word. And I'll give you the gospel. Take it to all the nations. And the commission was, go to every nation telling them to repent and believe for the kingdom of God is at hand Make disciples who keep the commandments. What are the commandments? Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. Every child who's aborted, image bearer, neighbor. This is the gospel. We have been sent out with it. Are we powerful? Yes, we're powerful. We're the bride of Christ. By bride, I mean helpmate bride. The scripture speaks of Jesus Christ as destroying every work of darkness. It says that he will soon crush Satan underneath our feet. When Jesus, who we all incrementalists and media just like say we follow, talked about sin, he said, how do you deal with sin? If you have sin and you acknowledge it as sin, you cut it off. He says, if your hand causes you to sin, chop it off. Your eye, gouge it out. Why? Because making an occasion for sin allows it to continue to grow. You might be able to help somebody in these ways, but you're keeping abortion around because you do not bring the gospel of God into conflict with the evil of the age. And so I'm going to apply immediatism to abortion to show you that while you may save some babies, you leave this wicked tree growing and all your iniquitous decrees are actually um, letting the justice continue to roll down. So we've got abortion. We've got a wicked tree here. Let's look at it. Immediatism versus incrementalism. Incrementalism shears to the branches of the abortion tree. All sorts of different ways that, we, that Greg talked about. 
from partial birth abortion to abortifacient drugs, various forms of murdering image bearers of God. Immediatism would be the axe, always and only at the root, the sin, chop down the tree. So it, d despite what someone says, I have a poster that I made that, that says that I care about these things and so on and so forth. That's not immediatism, incrementalism. That's incrementalism versus someone pretending to be an immediatist. The incrementalist, we see it all the time. They're, they're focused on things like parental consent, ultrasound laws, waiting periods, encourage people to choose life. The incrementalist, therefore, is like taking the shears to the branches, right? So they're ageist, like the gradual abolitionists of slavery that could, like Wilberforce never passed a bill said, let's start with like light-skinned black people on slave ships, and then once we protect them, we'll, we'll move to darker-skinned black people. That would be analogous to 20 weeks, 14 weeks, heartbeat, and so on and so forth. But um, like, like their precursors, they are ageist and racist. Bans on partial birth and, uh, abortion methods, so you have method bans. So what it ends up being, you know, heartbeat bills, dismemberment bans, all these kinds of things that they look at. They're trying to save babies, bring them close to hospitals, widen hallways. If you guys seen my pro-life victories video, Greg thinks it's wrong that we shut down those dingy ones and build those Titanics. I think it's, uh, or, or that, that it's good to build Titanic Planned Parenthoods. I think it's wrong. Um, and I think it's the product of incrementalism. Sorry if I'm moving a little fast, but you notice the difference between an immediatist and an incrementalist in that an immediatist says abortion is sin, turn to God, and goes out daily into that, into that work. Incrementalists say things like abortion hurts women. It does. But the focus is on it hurts women, not on abortion kills babies, even though they recognize that abortion kills babies. Abortion hurts women, abortion murders neighbors, so on and so forth. Don't want to belabor that point. So let's look at how it works. The incrementalist says, all right, we've got this wicked tree. Babies are dying. Partial birth abortion is really wicked. I surveyed the culture. I think that they're going to go for this. We can probably get rid of partial birth abortion. So they, you know, get a series of bills. They look at this guy, Carhartt. Leroy Carhartt, 1997, say this is inhuman, what he's doing to these babies. Partial birth abortion is gross. So they start trying him. By 2003, Bush signs the uh, partial birth abortion ban, and, you know, voila, cut off partial birth abortion, the method. Carhartt's sad, right? Ah, you know, you change the way he kills babies, because, of course, we know that it was really the banning of a specific method of abortion. And when you cut off something like partial birth abortion, um, of course, some other method grows up in its place. And so here, here we are. I don't know if you guys have paid attention to all the fundraising letters that you get, but Leroy Carhartt is still killing babies and has been throughout this whole period. He just changes the way he does it. And people talk about incremental victories and how they're saving lives and how we're just trying to be self-righteous and holy. But also what happened during this period was a proliferation of abortifacient drugs. So you changed one method, you cut off a method, a different form of late-term abortion that's not partial birth abortion goes into place, and abortifacient drugs become available over the counter. Abortifacient devices become widely popular. Why? The tree's still standing. You're not saying abortion's evil. You're not saying abortion's murder. You're saying partial birth abortion's bad. You're, you're playing with sin. So Jill Stanick says the next big pro-life conquest is to get rid of uh, the D&E, the dismemberment bills that are, being, uh, that are big news right now. And so that's that little branch there at the top. Let's cut that off. Well, that'll save some babies. But Jill Stanek in her own article says, of course there are other methods that might grow up in its place, such as, okay, so this is a, a pretty brutal looking. Of course, if they pass every dismemberment abortion bill in the country, they'll still be killing them this way and all the other ways. And uh, let's just run a scenario that we cut off the late-term abortion thing 
and we cut off the, all of the dilation, evacuation, curatage, and all that kind of stuff, the abortion providers themselves and pro-life advocates say and admit that they'll just come up with different ways of doing it, and we'll have labor induction abortions, and that way you can have, you know, body parts to traffic and all that kind of really sick stuff. Why? Why, if you chop off a branch, why does it always grow back? Because the culture's sick and in sin and demands abortion, wants abortion. That's why it grows back. There will be people who meet the demand over and over and over again. Another really bad thing about um, the pro-life incrementalism, the focusing on these different incremental measures and different forms and so on and so forth, and we know this because we're activists, when you're out on the streets or you're at an abortion mill, high school, a college, or a church, or whatever, people say things like, oh, I'm opposed to the late terms. But I mean that, like pointing to a first trimester, that's, that's acceptable. That's not what it looks like. You know, I, I aborted my baby with RU486. It doesn't matter. An image bearer. A, a partial birth abortion is a morally equivalent to abortion of a pre, uh, pre-implanted human being in the eyes of God, and in the eyes of Satan, who's growing the tree. So what happens is these branches fall off, and they make a big stir, and you think, well, it's, it's drawing up a bunch of support, and a lot of people in our culture are thinking abortion's bad, and that's good. No, they're thinking, they're not thinking abortion, child sacrifice is sin. They're thinking partial birth abortion's bad. Dismemberment's bad. That plan B that I stock up on is not bad. And all the while, the tree's growing, and the snake is happy, and as he said back in 1996 through uh, old Bill Clinton, abortion should not only be safe and legal, it should be rare, right? This is what pro-choicers used to say. It should be safe, legal, and rare. You know what pro-lifers, if you look at their bills, they save babies by saying abortion isn't safe for women. So what do they do? They shut down dirty clinics like Gosnell and they open up these big mega centers because they're trying to appeal to the culture, make abortion safe. Why? Because they want it to be rare. And you say, well, why don't you say abortion's murder and sin and seek its abolition? Well, because we can't, because it's legal, and the courts have said. So now instead of that wily snake saying that we've got to keep abortion safe, legal, and rare, we've got pro-lifers saying as long as abortion is legal, it should be safe, early, and painless. So pro-life leaders are passing legislation to make people go, whenever I go get my abortion, at least it won't be painful for the little kid. I don't want to have a baby with spina bifida. I don't want to have a Down syndrome baby. Well, good thing these pro-lifers passed these bills so we can give them uh, anesthesia. It's evil, wicked stuff. And here's two minutes. Well, that's, that slide's not supposed to look like that. I'll leave it up anyway. Here, here is how it works. How many of you guys go out to abortion mills, schools, and that sort of stuff? How many of y'all do that on a regular basis? Do you feel alone when you do it? Right? You go out to an abortion clinic, and it's like you and one other person. Right? And you live in a culture of hundreds of thousands of Christians. Why aren't they coming out? Because they're not practical immediatists. They're not thinking about loving their neighbor as themselves. Why aren't they coming out? Because they've placed their faith not in the power of God or in the word of God. They've placed their faith in incremental legislation. Well, you know, all we can do is vote. Well, hey, I mean, we just heard the other day. We are talking the other day, and people are telling us, hey, no, no, it's not legal to do that. We passed a dismemberment bill. Our governor signed it. So their, their, their conscience is satiated. They're okay. They don't have to do it. They don't have to rise up. They don't have to be the bride of Christ. They don't have to stand before the nation saying, repent. They don't have to look like the scourge of the earth. And they can just send money to somebody who's willing to do that. The immediatist is saying, the whole head is sick. Our nation practices child sacrifice. The people of God must say, no more. And we can't get the people of God to do it. Because they've got incremental junk that they think is better. They've denied the power of God, even though they have the appearance of godliness, they deny its power, and they say the gospel of God cannot be brought into conflict with abortion unless we have permission from the secularist. Why are babies being aborted, Greg? 
because people are being deceived. At, at this point, uh, Mr. Cunningham will give his responses to Russell. You know, Russell, I'm not going to let you get away with that. The inescapable conclusion of T. Russell Hunter's argument is that until we can save that baby, until we can outlaw the abortion of that baby, we should be utterly indifferent to the slaughter of that baby and that baby and older babies and older babies. And I came here to say to you, I'm committed to saving every baby I can at every point in gestation every day of the calendar, and praise God, it works. This guy who wrote this analysis, Professor New, University of Michigan, this, this is a very highly regarded study. It's the first study of its kind that has been published and commented on in social science journals, and he says the legislation that Russell is dissing and talking down and trash talking is saving babies' lives. Now, I, I appreciate the fact that Russell's very prophetic. Scripture says that Jesus came from the Father full of grace and truth. The grace part of this is the love, the compassion. The truth part is the prophetic part, confronting the culture about evil. Tragically, Russell has become so prophetic that I don't see the love. I don't see the compassion. He, he just glosses over the fact that the logical, inescapable conclusion of his obsession with outlawing birth control pills is that savable babies will be slaughtered en route to that goal. I share that goal with him. I'm working to achieve that goal with him. But in the meantime, I'm not going to allow savable babies to die. Russell doesn't seem to care about them. He just glosses over them. And Russell, I'm not going to let you get away with this, my friend. Read Metaxas' biography of William Wilberforce. William Wilberforce gave that speech to Parliament in which he advocated paying slave owners in compensation for freed slaves just weeks before his death. I mean, he was so weak that people could hardly hear what he was saying. He... he he wasn't doing that because he wanted to do it. He wasn't doing it because he, li he liked the idea of it. He was doing it because he didn't have the votes to get abolition without compensation. It was just as simple as that. It wasn't a compromise of moral principle. It was a strategic move. As Abraham Lincoln made a strategic move in not emancipating all the slaves, only emancipating the slaves he thought he could get away with and still preserve the Union. Let me very quickly say to you that the history of social reform is the history of both immediatism and incrementalism going all the way back to John Adams, going all the way back to the founding fathers, the Constitutional Convention. John Adams, Massachusetts, hated slavery, but he knew he had to let it into the Constitution or there would be no Union, because without Virginia there would be no Union. Without South Carolina, there would be no union. And the consequence of no union was that the southern colonies, now southern states, would become a slave-holding nation, two separate nations, a northern nation and a southern nation. And it was the goal of the southern nations to take slavery all the way down south through Central America into Brazil, which was then the largest slave-owning center, slave-trading center, in the hemisphere, and they wanted all of the territories all the way to the Pacific Ocean that were not yet states to become slave-owning states. And so the abolitionists at the Constitutional Convention knew that if they didn't let slavery in, there would be no union, and with, without a union, there was no hope of ending slavery. And because there was a union, and because time was bought for the North to become strong enough to face down the South, slavery ended up being defeated. But even after the Civil War, even after the slaves were set free, they weren't free because they were forced to become sharecroppers, 
most often on the same plantations, living under the same circumstances they had when they were in, involved with slavery. One of Russell's big criticisms of the pro-life movement is that every time we save this baby, we're, we're, we are arguing by inference that it's okay to kill those babies. That's an absurd argument to make. When William Wilberforce said we're going to redesign the slave ships to minimize the pain and suffering for the slaves, no reasonable person would say that Wilberforce was by implication saying the slave trade was okay if you did it on a comfortable slave ship. Nobody made that argument. It's an absurd argument. It's exactly the argument that Russell is making about abortion, that if we save that baby, somehow we're condoning the slaughter of that baby. Simply not true. When Martin Luther King worked in 1964 for public accommodation for black people, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, he wasn't saying, but it's okay to deny black people voting rights. Then in 1965, he passed the Voting Rights Act. He wasn't saying, well, now we've got the vote, but it's okay for housing discrimination to take place. In 1968, the Fair Housing Act passed. It was an incremental process, and King wasn't saying, because we've won public accommodation rights, voting discrimination is okay. He took it one step at a time. You know why? He didn't have the votes to do it all at once. He did it as quickly as he possibly could. I say what I'm about to say gently and respectfully because I admire T. Russell, but I say this nonetheless. Over and over again in his postings, Russell is very harsh about people who do this work full time, people who, who fundraise. Russell Hunter uses our abortion photographs. You use them. The Center for Bioethical Reform created the largest archive of this sort of imagery that exists anywhere. And thank God he uses them. Thank God you use them. But guess what? It wouldn't have been possible for those photographs to be available to you if we weren't professional pro-life activists, if we didn't have professionals, if we wouldn't have done an enormous amount of fundraising. We've raised millions of dollars to fund the cost of creating this archive. And then Russell says, may I use your photos, which were created by full-time activists that couldn't have been created without full-time activists, pursuant to fundraising that involved raising millions of dollars and wouldn't have been possible without that fundraising. And oh, by the way, I think less of you because you're a full-time pro-life activist and you fundraise. Russell's fundraising, he just lets me do it for him. And I don't mind that. I do fundraising for people all over the world. People are using these photos all over the world. And I thank God that Russell's using them. And I thank God that I have an opportunity to partner with him and to partner with you in the use of these photos. But don't condemn people who fundraise because those pictures wouldn't exist if we wouldn't have done a lot of fundraising. And the professionalism that went into the creation of those photos wouldn't have been possible without full-time people doing the work. It's very, very important that we not be like the guy Jesus was talking about in the parable where he said the Pharisee and the tax collector went into the temple to pray and the Pharisee said, thank you, Lord, that I'm not like that guy. Thank you that I'm not like that tax collector guy. I'm holy and he's not and the tax collector wouldn't even look up at heaven. He said, Please forgive me, I am a sinner. I'm not condemning Russell Hunter. I'm not, I thank God for the abolitionist movement. We work with abolitionists. We love abolitionists. But I don't get this anger. I don't get this hostility. I don't get this mischaracterization that we're people in the pro-life movement who don't pray, that we don't call the nation to repent, that we're that we're eager to compromise with the forces of darkness. None of that is true. I don't know why Russell has to say that. We can admire him without him vilifying us. So at this time, 
we're going to move into the cross-examination portion. So to explain what's going to happen, each individual will have 15 minutes to ask questions of their, uh, their opponent. And uh, what I would like is if this could not be a time for long monologues guised in the form of questions. In other words, long three or five minute speeches before a question if possible. And then if we could try to limit the responses so to, to a few minutes. Um, uh, we would like to start with allowing Greg to, to ask questions of Russell. And then that will be re returned with Russell asking questions of Greg. Russell, your um, criticisms of the pro-life movement, which are so numerous, I sat out in the car before I came in here just sort of overwhelmed by the incredible negativity you have toward people who love you, who admire you, who respect you, who want to work with you. And, and I'm thinking, wh where, where do I even begin in, in, in trying to address all of this sort of hostility when we should be working together, not talking one another down. You and I have very real differences, but our, but our similarities are wildly more common than our, our differences are. Uh, but let me, let me be begin by asking you this. You, you, you're, criti you're critical of the pro-life movement because we're willing to work with secularists and we're willing to work with ungodly people and we're willing to work with people who don't claim the name of Christ, and we're willing to work with people of other religions and, and other political persuasions, and on and on and on. And, and that's, that's absolutely true. I'll work with anybody. I don't care who it is. If it'll save a baby's life, I will work with that person. I mean, they could be the embodiment of evil, and I'll cooperate with them if doing so would save a baby's life. Now, I'll share the gospel with them while I do it, but I'll work with them, for heaven's sake. Russell, if hypothetically, and heaven forbid this should ever happen, your two-year-old should stumble into a swimming pool and, and be pulled out near death from drowning, and you call the paramedics and they come, would you quiz, and this is exactly the language that you use in one of your Facebook posts, would you quiz the paramedics about their worldview and their sense of Jesus before you let them resuscitate your child? Or, or would, you, would you want them, irrespective of what their worldview was and their religious, spiritual orientation, would you want them to resuscitate your child? Um, of course I'd want them to resuscitate my child. That's a very, very silly uh, straw man version of a question of a very complex issue. I believe, to answer the real question, that when we are fighting evils, we do need to fight them on God's terms, and we need him as our helper. So, for instance, I believe that God does actually hate homosexuality. I believe that he turns people who turn their backs on him over to homosexuality. I don't believe that God blesses and loves the work of people who ally, say, like with homosexual pro-lifers. So from a strategic, even pragmatic point of view, I think that if I want the power of God with the local society that I work with or International Coalition of Abolitionist Societies, yes, I don't want to join hands with the very thing that I'm fighting. I truly do believe that a God-hating worldview and a denial of the power and providence of God and his love and his plan to redeem the world, a denial of that is the very thing which makes abortion grow and is possible. So to work with that worldview, I'm not talking about it, someone saving my baby from a, from a swimming pool accident, to work with and create strategies and come alongside of people who adopt the very worldview and apologize for the very sin and darkness that that tree is growing in, I think is folly. So it's you'll not allow self-righteous, it's because I think it's actually Okay, silly. you're actually repeating yourself now, but so you'll allow other people's children to die, but not your own. What? That's, that's the bottom line. I'll, I'll you'll, allow you'll allow other people's children to die because we shouldn't work with somebody who's not a born-again believer, but We're you won't let your own child die. 
Now, I'm not talking about letting people die. The pro-life movement, when they write bills or put strategies together, they specify who will die and who won't. Okay, now, get this. Get this. That's a lie, Russell. I'm calling you out. That is a lie. I didn't decide who, what the provisions of the bill would be. The courts and the culture decided that. Yes. I, I gave my best shot at saving every baby I could save at every opportunity for me to do that and for you to lie about me and say that I was giving this up suggest that I was giving away something I never had. Suggest, excuse yeah. me, Russ, excuse me, suggest that I had the power to save babies I chose not to save. That's a lie, and it's a lie that you have repeated over and over again. I'm not the one who decides what the culture and the courts have to say about all of this. I work to influence what they have to say, but I don't get to decide what they have to say. They set the limits, and I work within those limits. So don't put that on me, and don't put it on the pro-life movement, because that's a lie. Okay, Greg, what I'm saying, because I do want to work with you, not in this sort of way that you're suggesting. I, I actually do want to work with you. But what I want to work on is calling the nation to God. We do that too, Russell. No, no. In, in its entirety. That's what I want to work on. And so whenever I criticize, when I criticize things like a, a guy who's writing a bill and he surveys the culture and he says, the culture thinks it's okay to punish children for the crimes of their fathers, so i got to give in to that. I know he may have a good heart, and I'm not saying he's You're bad. You're not giving in. But what I'm saying... You're not giving in, Russell. You're only giving in if you have the power to do something and choose to not do it. We do have that power. We don't have that power. Yes, we do. I did not have the power to keep a rape exception out of my bill. I could count. Listen. Russell, it's really easy for you to sit in front of your computer and post these angry I don't rants. just sit in listen, front of my computer, Listen, Greg. Russ. Listen, Russ. These aren't potheads, and I don't make no, all Russ, the memes hey, from Russ, my, my Russ, computer. Please don't. Else. You know, talking over me is not a reasoned argument. Ask questions. It's, it's not, it's, Ask it's, some questions. Yeah, it's, not, it's not a reasoned argument. What's the next When you're question? standing on the floor of the House and, and you have the count and you know that the other side has the votes to put a rape exception in. I wouldn't be in. putting that bill forward. You're, you're, you're not. What, that's exactly right, Russ. You wouldn't have put the bill forward. Oh, I would not. And all these babies' lives would have been lost, and you don't care about that. Greg, that's 200, the question. Russell, pro, do you, do you, 200 do you care? pro-life bills have been Russell, passed, and they've been butchering over a million Russell, babies every year, and they're Russell, doing more now than they care? ever have. What are you Russell, talking about? Do you care about the lives of these babies? Yes. Well, then why, why would you It's a straw man to say that we, because... When we go to abortion mills and we talk to people online or wherever, you're changing the subject, Russ. It's because you don't we get care to do about that. those babies. Russ, you're changing Just the subject. You hold on, I can't understand. Russ, what's, what's the me? question? Excuse what's me. The question. The question is, do you care about these babies' yes. lives? Okay. Well, then why would you say we shouldn't enact legislation that would save the abortion lives? is murder? Yes. That's what we all should be focused on. And it will, passing that will save those babies' lives and all the ones that you outlined as abandoning. I refuse to think let's, of children as increments, Greg. Let's I'm sorry. do both, Russ. Let's do both. We don't have to do one or the other. We can do both. What's the question? I, I don't know what the question the is. The question is, hold, I hold care on. about those children. Hold on. What is the question? And then the Russ, question let, him, is, let him ask. The question is, what about these babies whose lives were saved by enacting incremental legislation while we I, were, excuse me, Russ, while we were working to abolish all abortions. It's not either or. Why, why can't we do okay, both? Okay, yeah. Russ. In my q and I'm going to ask him if you know what a question is. That's a statement, Greg. Okay, go ahead and answer the I'm question, I'm asking Russ. you why we can't do both. That's the question. You can do one. You can do both as long as you don't undermine the whole project. Exactly. As long as you don't. When you're out on the street. Hold on, let him finish. Let him finish. When you're out on the street and you're talking to someone about abortion and they bring up the rape exception. They always bring up the rape exception. Always. It's the one thing they always need. And it's the one thing that incrementalists are always willing to give them. So it's leaving the culture dead in their sin and in the speculation yeah. that murdering children is okay because of exceptions. The pro-lifers put them in. And you have okay, not okay. addressed... Next question. Go ahead. What's the next question for us? The next question is a related question. You didn't address the question that I asked earlier, which is that was William Wilberforce, when he supported legislation to redesign the slave ships, mm -hmm. 
Was he saying then that slaves transported on those ships yeah. are being transported morally? That's, that, did no, he, he did he make it more difficult to abolish the slave trade by doing that? No, he wasn't. I already said that. Well, then why am I doing that? No, see, he, he, an abolitionist, another MP, authors a bill and says, hey, you know what? We're all being, de we're, you, the whole culture and the whole House of Parliament is being deceived into all this incremental nonsense and slave trade is going on. Wilberforce, in his own words, says they start, past, they start dealing with these things. In Eric Metax, I didn't bring Eric Metaxas' book because it's like kind of a popular book, but like I do have Pollock's book. And he does say, I became convinced because of these bills that we could, not, we could no longer do any of this regulation. It's in his stuff. In the 1807, I, you can take this with you. In the letter on abolition of the slave trade, in 1807, on page 254, immediate abolition preferable to gradual in the of West. Of course it is, but he pursued both, Russell. No, this is, he we pursued, quoted it. He pursued both. You can't change his voting no, record. Well, no, you're right. I didn't say he was both, perfect. He spoke weeks before his death. He spoke in favor of compensating What's the last slave thing owners. Hold on, Russ. You don't get to ask questions. Yeah, he, sure. question. Next question. Sure. He spoke sure. in favor of compensating, not because he was in favor he of denounced, it. Did he denounce Wait. compensation? I'll just state he it. He totally it's a denounced it. He denounced but he knew compensation. He right, but he knew and he published he, right. a Hold recantation on, Russ. in the Russ, paper. That's an answer. Russ, you're conflating two things. Clever strategy, but it won't work with me. You're conflating two things. He was a moral immediatist. He denounced compensation for these guys, but he knew he didn't have the votes to get abolition if he didn't put it in. And so he spoke in favor of it. Read Metaxas. He's reading right out of the parliamentary record. He's reading the transcripts of the speeches. Mm -hmm. You can't change Wilberforce's voting record. Wilberforce again and again voted for incremental regulation of the slave trade, not because he wanted it, not because this he liked it. This is a statement. It. Anytime Wilberforce did that, he was wrong. And well, then you better Wilberforce change your believed. email address. You better change your no, email No, the two address. great objects were not about this. The reformation of manner and the abolition of the slave trade? Yeah. I have two great objects. It's the deobjectification of women and the abolition of human abortion. It's not a Wilberforce William reference. Wilberforce. It's my two objects. Was Thank William you. Wilberforce both an, an absolutist, uh, an immediatist, and an incrementalist? As I said in the presentation, his error was dealing with the trade and then slavery. He thought that if you cut off the trade, slavery would perish. Was Lincoln wrong to be both an, an immediatist and an incrementalist? I agree with what Harriet Tubman said whenever they asked her about Lincoln. She said, well, Lincoln, this war is going to keep on going until he makes the right decision and says he's going to abolish slavery. This is after the Emancipation Proclamation. She was asked, what's the deal? What do you think about this? And she said, if Lincoln decides to kill the snake, the war will be over, slavery will be abolished. But the thing is, is you never wound a snake because it will always jump back up and bite you. Was I believe Lincoln repented as well. <laughs> Let him ask Lincoln, the next question, Russ. And Link, what, here's the, here's the answer. Lincoln himself does not credit the incrementalist, the colonizationist, or any of those people with the abolition of slavery. He credits the Garrisonians. And you know what? This is a little high-minded. Let him ask his next question, Russ. So bad hey, is Russell, we're was Martin Luther King both an incrementalist and an immediatist? In the sense that you're saying? or In, in any sense. Uh, he believed that racial inequality was sin and preached a gospel of freedom. So he's an immediatist. He was an immediatist and he was an incrementalist because he didn't go after all of this simultaneously. Oh, well, yeah, it, that's fine. That's, took it, that's fine. Right, he took it one step at a time. So what I hear you saying that's fine. is that um, Wilberforce was wrong on incrementalism. Abraham Lincoln was wrong on incrementalism. Martin Luther King was wrong on in incrementalism. Okay. It, well, Martin Luther King was an incrementalist. He, he was not an You know what immediatism and incrementalism the next, are? The differences are? What's the next question? Russell, question. do you understand the difference between a moral immediatist yes, I've read and a strategic... Forsyth's book. Right, right. but he, Forsyth isn't the only one who understands this. Yeah. Why, why do you persist in conflating those two concepts as though they're the same thing? 
Because if you claim to be a moral immediatist and undermine your moral immediatism, you are what the Word of God says, someone who perverts justice. Undermine. I wonder if these children who are alive today, because we passed this incremental legislation, I wonder if they're going to think we undermine. The I don't know cause anything about them. Is this a question? So, last question. You can oppose me like they opposed Gary. Hold on, Russ. I'll Last question. You've only got time for one more. And then you can respond. I'd like to return to the question with, with, with which I began, which Russ hasn't answered. Should we allow these babies to die rather than enact incremental legislation? No. I'm sorry? Like, should we allow, should, should we allow babies should to die? Should we allow these because... Right, the, right, the charade we, is... The charade is not even what we're talking about, the incrementalism, immediatism debate, focusing the ax at the tree, getting all the people who follow incrementalism to become immediatist and help put that ax to the branch, would you, to, would, the, would, to the root. Would, would, you, would you answer this Versus question? The tree branches. Okay. Would you Look, that was the last question? question. Russ, go ahead and answer that, and then right, we're going to end this. Right. He's, he, just for the record, Russ didn't answer the question, should we have allowed these babies to die, which this university professor says, would have died had that legislation not been enacted. Should we have allowed them to die rather than enacting incremental legislation? Right. Okay. Russ, answer that question, and then we'll change. Um, well, I, I firmly believe that abortion is evil, and it is one of these things that the powers and principalities, that would, darkness and the high places, are very into. It's a crown jewel of darkness, and I actually believe that if they can keep abortion going by deceiving people into becoming gradualist, they will do it. And if to deceive them, they have to give them empty, illusory victories, and law professors can claim that babies were saved, they'll do it. But like, if someone goes to an abortion mill and shoots a doctor, a baby might be saved that day, but that's not going towards abolishing abortion. It's not establishing justice that day. Is that your it answer, Russ? That day. May, I, may I ask for a clarification to your answer? You're saying this guy's making this up? Uh, no, I have to read it. But I, I have to say that convincing people to be gradualists by saying, hey, look, we saved some while they're still being... I'm pretty sure that you can convince people to be gradualists for the next 40 years. Hey, Russell, let's be dangling. both. Okay, hey, we're going to stop let's this. Be both. Let's be both. Okay, at this time, we are going to have 15 minutes of more fun <laughs> with Russ being able to ask questions of Mr. Cunningham. So again, I would just like to reiterate that it's very hard for people to understand the conversation if we're talking over each other. So, um, Sorry. So Russ, ask your questions, stop, let Mr. Cunningham have a response, and we'll, we'll try to go back and forth. Um, I'll just kind of stand over here. I noticed that um, I kind of get up and I say, immediatism is about calling people to repent of the national sin of slavery, abortion, or whatever it is. And I couch the whole thing in sort of this question between God has said versus did God really say? Believing in the power of God versus hiding in the shadow of Egypt, looking to war horses and chariots. I keep couching it that way. And you keep standing up and saying, are you going to step over this baby? Do you not love this baby? All this kind of stuff. Is it that you don't want to deal with immediatism as immediatism, as the way actual immediatists define it, or is it that you want to avoid that conversation and constantly straw man it as though I'm not the kind of person that goes to abortion mills or schools and all that kind of stuff to try to save Babies from death and destruction. Okay, so that's the question? Yeah. Okay. Do, do you really not understand it? Russ, I'm going to make this as simple as Sin. I can. Yeah, I'm going to make this as simple as I can. I'm determined to save that baby, that baby, that baby. If I save that baby, that's, that's an immediate kind of thing. It's an absolute kind of thing because that baby's only a few days old. Right. I'm committed to saving a baby that's only a few seconds old. Well, excuse me, one, one second old. 
all of these babies. We can be both. It's a false dilemma. The question say we is, have to be one or the other. do you focus and do you believe that to abolish abortion, you have to fight abortion as abortion, murder, sin in and of itself? So the bill you draft would be abortion should not be done at any stage because it is murder. Not abortion shouldn't be done because it causes pain. Okay, Are you trying to that. save babies or... My bill, you... my bill begins by saying that it's the policy of the state of Pennsylvania yes. to confer rights of personhood on babies from the moment of fertilization. Now, we know that we have to put a severability clause in there because the courts are going to treat that as surplusage and they're just going to strike it down. So now let's try to save the babies we can save. But if you, if you look at this legislation, both the Thornburg version and the Casey version say that's a baby. They don't yeah. just say that's a baby or that's a baby or that's a baby. So this argument that you make about somehow if we say this that is a baby's no, this, a baby at 20 weeks. This isn't the question. The, the question is, if you understand that what we're saying when we say immediatism is calling the nation to repent of the sin of child sacrifice and, and that focusing on that will abolish human abortion. That's what we mean by immediatism, treating sin like sin, bringing the gospel of the kingdom of God into conflict with child sacrifice. That's what I mean by immediatism, and you keep on breaking it down Russell, to something else. No, no, no. Do you Listen, understand that? R Russell, do you understand that my position is that we can do both? Because I, 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 I have a suggestion to make. Okay, and how do you do both? Let, let him that respond, the Russ. The way you do both is the way Martin Luther King did both. Mm -hmm. he, he, he talked about abortion as sin, and he talked about abortion as a human rights violation. Because, both. because, yes. because it's both of those things. You don't have to be one or the other. This binary thing, that it's this or that, is, is just like the, if I could finish the thought, yes. it's just like your argument that, that we only need uh, people involved in this movement who are grassroots, sort of unofficial, part-time, you know, whatever, not full-time paid I'm fundraising. I'm not opposed to fundraising, not, by not, the way. I Russ, say that. Okay, Russ, I have the posts and I'd be glad to put them up. We're, I'm, a, we're, I'm opposed to people using fundraising considerations to create their campaigns. Oh, well, I'm opposed to that Stop as well. simplifying the complexity Russell, of I my I have vitriol. emails from you in which you go on and on about you don't spend a penny fundraising, you don't spend any time on fundraising. You well, don't I don't, do but that's me. Okay, hold on, right, Russ. Right, and, and you trash talk people who do, and you, How is this Russell, an answer to Russell, my you're question, talking over Greg. me. Russell, you are talking over me. Yes, I am. How is yes. this an answer yeah, to my question? And please don't do that, because I have the posts and emails from you in, in which you go on and on about the, the, the disaster that full-time pro-life activists are because they're keeping the church in, in, in a, a deactivated state. Yes. I say we need more full-time activists we need more part-time activists. We need more volunteers. We need people. It's of a different every debate, and I'm taking your response. You're, it's you're, not you're a stumping for it. Debate. It's a different debate of whether or not uh, the abolitionist movement or the pro-life movement, the way we're organized, is a different debate. It doesn't have to be either Incrementalism or. Incrementalism versus immediatism. It doesn't have to be either or. This is an example of your tendency to be binary, that it has to be this or it has to be that. I think it has to be both. Okay, next question, Russ. <laughs> I want one of the questions that I asked to be answered. Well, uh, then ask it again and I'll try again. Do you believe that the helpmate bride of Christ is sitting on the pews not doing anything and in part it's because they're placing their faith in incremental measures and things like voting? The reason that they're not at the abortion mills or the gap displays? The reason that so few people, do you think it has anything to do with them placing their trust in this bill that's supposed to get rid of it for us. Do you think that argument has any weight? Or are you going to ignore it? I think it does have weight, and I think there are people who fall into that trap, but there's a bigger problem. And the bigger problem is we can't win this battle without the church, and we don't have the church. Exactly. Because, Russell, please let me finish. I just agree with you. We can't win this battle without the church, and we don't have the church because we don't have the pastors. And we don't have the pastors because of the way they're being trained at Christian colleges and Christian seminaries that are doing absolutely nothing to adequately train 
the leaders of the body of Christ to mobilize the body of Christ okay. against. If I that's, can finish, that's a six, Russell, let that's, me decide what the answer is. Okay. Against as long as I get to ask Russell, another question. Against child sacrifice, because all over this country, secular schools and women's studies programs are cranking out full-time paid staff professional activists for the abortion industry mm -hmm. by the thousands. We don't have anything like that on our side, which is run by part-time amateur volunteers. And until we change the way we're training our pastors, we're not going to get different pastors. I understand your answer. And the church isn't going to be I mobilized against abortion. I understand abortion. your answer. That's a bigger the problem. The follow-up question during the cross-examination portion of this debate is, do you realize that when we go talk to those pastors and say, hey, abortion is child sacrifice, and not only does the culture need to repent of its practice, but you need to repent of your apathy, do you realize they say, I support Amendment 1? That's what they say. Why are the pastors not and helping that's not you? enough for because us. Because you've got them in this... Right. So what's what's again, the question, it's Russ? It's both of those problems. It's not the one or the other. It's both. Again, you're being binary. The it's argument... Both. All the All the posts that you think are just being mean to people is I see all these pastors who ought to be preaching and leading their people. Amen. I see them. And I see the thing that's... the the, the grand delusion that's keeping them from doing that. Or that they can always cite as doing enough. It's, it's always, I support a CPC, or I, I, I vote pro-life. Those are incremental, and that's what I speak against. So, Russ, what what's the question? Those, and the reason for that is because of the way they're trained. It's by the pro-life right, movement. It's Do you both, understand it's, it's both of those things. Russ, your antipathy, your antipathy toward the pro-life movement those ideas, just keeps Those surfacing. ideas are keeping abortion legal. It's Let me ask the both. question. It's both of those things, Russ. It's not the one or the other. I'm, I, we aim at destroying any and every idea that actually keeps those pastors in their seats. So when I speak out and rail against the pro-life incrementalism stuff, it's for the, the thing that you want, the goal. Okay, Russ, what's your question? Okay, um, what was the name of the bill that William Wilberforce wrote that uh, changed the slave ships? I think it was the Dublin, the Dublin bill. Dublin if bill. If I'm pronouncing okay, it correctly. Okay, so... So the Dublin bill... He didn't write it, by the way. Uh, he didn't write it. it. Right. When was it written? I'm sorry? When was it written? The bill that you keep citing. The, the exact date it was written? I can get you that the information. Bill that was I about, it committed to the memory. bill that was about changing slave ships. I, 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 I do not have the date committed to memory. Should I have? No, you don't need to have it. It was written prior to Wilberforce's first abolition bill, the first time, and it passed, right? The Dolben Act, Correct. 1788. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Wilberforce got up in 1789 and gave a speech. I had a part of a quote. What was his speech? There's a big section in it. This is such a wicked enormity that we must go beyond regulation. <laughs> Wilberforce was mocked by the gradualists. The debate was between gradualists and immediatists. And the question? <laughs> I just want to know if he knows the history. I know the books that you've read, and I've read the like pro-life blogs. Russell, again, you're conflating two issues. He hated the idea of just changing the design of the slave ships. He hated it. Yes, he, he did. He wanted to abolish slavery now, but he knew he didn't have the votes to abolish it now. Yeah. And so he took what he could get when he could get it. And it wasn't either or. He wasn't a binary okay. guy. Okay. He pursued both strategies simultaneously. And, we're not, I mean, you guys got to read a lot of books, but he actually basically said... We can't make, that's where I learned the whole, you can't have one strategy undermine another strategy, but it's a mutual Okay, it's a weeks point. before his death, he was speaking to Parliament in favor Here. of paying slave owners to release their slaves. Wait. So please don't try Wait. to push the idea that, that he was not a compromiser. He didn't compromise on principle. He did compromise on strategy and tactics. Next okay. question. So the lost person on the campus outside of the gap display? Who's the atheist in your, in your analogy? I, 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 I missed the first part. The, the lost person at the gap display who's yeah. the atheist? Yeah. Because I, I think it's a human rights violation. I think humans have rights because no human has the right to kill another human, and so by proxy, there's a right to life. That atheist does not know God. Okay? They need to hear the gospel. Amen. Okay, and so and we agree on that. Amen. Do you think that they are more likely to become opposed to abortion 
if they turn their life over to Christ and they see their sin and give it to him, or that you can convince them by a human rights violation? This is the first part of the question. You think that it is the wisest strategy to say, with secular people, we use secular arguments, and with people, like you said, who may believe in the gospel, we use biblical arguments. We don't, you made the point, and the I first agree point, with The that, first question, do you, I just respond, know, do you actually believe that? Right. You Before made the, the point, and I agree with it, we don't know who believes what. We don't know who the atheists are. Exactly. If you, if you, gosh, give me a chance to finish. It's a two-part question, sorry. Yeah, please, please give me a chance to finish. Okay. It's not either or. We make sure that both sets of arguments are heard at a gap display. We don't know who the believers are and who the unbelievers are. We want to make certain that both sets of arguments are being made. We're constantly looking for opportunities right. to share our faith in Christ. We constantly coordinate with campus ministry folks to make sure there are people there sharing the gospel, okay. just as there are people there making human rights arguments. It's not either or, Russell. It's both. We, we do both. Okay, okay. The, the reason I asked, I wanted to make sure... I have emails from you basically saying that when you go to Christian schools, you bring Christian displays, and when you go to secular schools, you bring secular displays, and you give me a rationale for it. I didn't print out your emails, because this isn't about what you, you know, what CBR does. The reason I asked the question, and the follow-up question is, is one of the criticisms of abolitionism is that we're trying to take the gospel and the whole, like, repent of sin, and apply it to the nation of, as a whole. And this is not a qu debate question, I just want to know, personally, do you think that that's just folly, that the idea of the nation repenting of child sacrifice and a revival preceding abolition is folly and a waste of time? Or do you no. think that it's, it's worth our, not, not both and. I'm I just don't asking. think it's folly. Okay. I don't think it's folly. But we should do both. We should work for revival. We should pray for revival. We should share the gospel at every opportunity. And we should make every argument we can make to save the life of every baby that, that's, that's, whose life is imperiled, to enact every bill we can act, to dissuade every mother we can dissuade. We should do all of those things and not just be binary and say it's got to be one or it's got to be the other. Okay, last question, Russ. Oh, we should have just gone to a coffee shop and talked about this for a long, long time. But if time. we did that, we wouldn't have the YouTube video that thousands of people are going to be watching. This video, this Here's YouTube video isn't as good as it could be. We just filmed the coffee shop thing. So what's the last question? Um, yeah. We're burning time, man. Can we go to a coffee, to a coffee shop? And the answer no. is yes, and I'm buying because I fundraise. That's true. <laughs> but uh, maybe, in, maybe in the Q&A I can explain the fundraising thing. Most of the complexity of the arguments that we make, not just me, but abolitionists, are, are not as binary as you kind of make them. The tree thing. The, I'll get to a question here. The tree thing. Do you agree that the partial birth abortion ban banned a method of abortion and that the people who were doing that method just started murdering in a different way? And do you agree that during that period the time, money, energy that was spent on that bill was a waste. Okay. Uh, yes, I agree that there are three alternative ways to kill babies at the same age. Justice Kennedy, in his opinion, said the only reason I'm signing on to this ban is because there are three other ways to kill babies. But in the, uh, in the course of litigating this case, up through the district court, the circuit court, the U.S. Supreme Court, all of the, the press coverage of all of this, the diagrams, all of the testimony from Carhartt, horrifying stuff from transcripts where Carhartt was admitting that these babies writhe in pain and on and on and on, changed public opinion regarding the humanity of the baby measurably and changed public opinion regarding the inhumanity of abortion. And again, then why you were we running no, no inhuman follow -ups. campaigns we're out of time. in 2015? I'm sorry? The inhuman campaign that focused on Leroy Carhartt in 2015. If we are changing public opinion, why? An improvement in public opinion, again, you're being binary. You're assuming that because we can't win everything right now, which has never happened 
ever in the history of social reform. That's ever. a straw man. I, no, as I minute. said, wait, I, wait, I didn't wait, think it's Wait a minute. Overnight. It's never happened. You're assuming that, it, that, that these victories of individual babies' lives being saved are worthless, that God doesn't care about this. So we shouldn't care about it. We should just be going for the whole enchilada. Okay, we are out of time. I love Thank you, you, Russ. Wow. Sometimes it seems like it. <laughs> so. I, I want people to think of this guy as T. Russell, not T. Rex. Why do you guys keep saying T. Russell? That's just how I Your name, man. I say T. Russell. Okay. <laughs> no, one calls, no one calls me that. We, we have five-minute closing statements. And then we'll go to audience questions. Uh, Russ, you close first, followed by Greg. Okay, I'm going to close with the word of God. I'm not going to read the whole thing in five minutes, but <clears throat> this is from the prophet, of I, uh, prophet Isaiah, chapter 30. And it's not just because I'm self-righteous and holy. I really, truly believe this. And I believe that it's applicable to this conversation and to all conversations like this. Isaiah 30, ah, oh, stubborn children, declares the Lord, who carry out a plan, but not mine, and who make an alliance, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, who set out to go down to Egypt, the governing, the rulers, without asking for my direction to take refuge in the protection of Pharaoh and to seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore, shall the protection of Pharaoh turn to your shame and the shelter in the shadow of Egypt to your humiliation. Egypt's help is worthless and empty. Therefore, I have called her Rahab who stood still. The, re the reason I read this passage in the conclusion is that I do think that a lot of the pro-life incrementalists uh, have good motivations. They're trying to save as many babies as they can. The, the argument that I want to make that I may not have made sufficiently is that they're placing their faith and their trust and their hope in Egypt. They're going, they're trying to fight sin by adding sin to sin. In Isaiah 10, one of the verses that I had in the presentation Woe to those who decree iniquitous decrees and the writers who keep writing oppression to turn aside the needy from justice that they may make the fatherless their prey. The word of God is clear on at least this point. When there are grave injustices and evils going on in your midst, you ought to, because you love your neighbor, do justice and show mercy. My big beef, my big problem with the incrementalism, is that people, instead of trusting in the word of God and coming together as the bride of Christ and bringing the gospel into conflict with the evil of the age and doing what we are commanded to do, instead of being like Jonah to Nineveh, we go and we say, what do the laws say? What can I get within the current federal ruling? And so we look at the statues and we, and we uh, add sin to sin. The debate, as I started it out, is uh, you can get into all these different straw mans about whether or not I'd let my daughter die in a swimming pool and all that kind of stuff. But what I want people to understand, the debate between immediatism and incrementalism when it's couched in the which should we rally around, which should we come together, if all Christians had to say, I'm going to go and I'm going to be an immediatist and I'm going to work on one project together, all my funding, all my um, energy, my time, my talent, my church, which project should the people of God do? He may call it binary. Should we all pick up the axe and lay it to the trunk of the tree? over and over and over, no matter how long it takes, always the gospel of the kingdom of a God, the sin of child sacrifice, over and over and over and over again. Should we do that? Should that be what we unify around? Or should we continue to say, that's good, I like that, but I'm going to work on 
cutting down these branches. And these guys are going to work on cutting down these branches. And we'll continue to do the best that we can because we want to save the babies. The accusation that we're too sanctimonious and self-righteous and all this kind of stuff doesn't actually fit. It's just a desire to be obedient and trust in the power, the one weapon that we have that really can do it, and to wield it together. My contention, you can call it on Facebook uh, mean or whatever, my contention is that the people of God are under a false delusion that incrementalism is what they ought to be paying attention to. They ought to be unifying. I don't find incrementalism in the Bible. I don't find incrementalism in the historical record about fighting social justice, except for that it is a tutor to tell us, don't play around with that. Stand on my word. Learn to do good. Seek to correct injustice. And trust in me. So, at the end, just the concluding statement. It's just a question of, like, do you believe in God? God who made planets, God who made man, God who rescued man by stepping down among us. God, very God, powerful God, who can abolish abortion and mystery of mysteries, has decided to do these things through his people. Do you believe in that God? If we can get people to believe in him and trust in him, we can abolish abortion. But if we can't get people to believe in him and trust in him, we will not abolish abortion. My contention, and you can call it mean, but I mean it, is that the people of God are being deceived and they're going down to Egypt and they're hiding under the shadow of Pharaoh instead of the living God. So that's the choice. Thank you, Russ. Let's do both. Let's do both. Where is it written we have to do one or the other? Let's do both because that's the history of social reform. That's how social reform works as a spiritual issue, as a social justice issue. It doesn't have to be the one or the other. Russell doesn't find incrementalism in the Bible. I find it in the Bible. It jumps out at me. The Apostle Paul says, 1 Corinthians 3.1, Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but worldly, merely infants in Christ. I gave you milk and not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. The Apostle Paul revealing the law of God incrementally to people as they were able to digest it, as they were able to process it. Mark 10.4, this is Jesus speaking. They said Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. This is the law we're talking about. And Jesus said it was because of the hardness of your hearts that Moses wrote you this law. And he went on to say that what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. It was public opinion, Jesus is saying, that motivated God to say to Moses, the people aren't ready for tough divorce laws. So let's incrementally start with permissive divorce laws and then make them much, much more restrictive as time goes on. Jesus was saying that. When Peter came to Jesus and said, what's this temple tax thing? Should we pay the temple tax? Jesus said, you know what? I can make an argument that we, that we don't owe the temple tax, but we'll compromise and we'll pay it lest we offend them. And as, as, I, as I read that, Jesus was picking his fights. He was essentially saying, preaching the gospel is worth getting crucified over, and indeed you will. But not a question over taxation policy. That's not worth getting sidetracked on. Let's stay focused on the important stuff. Abraham Lincoln, when his Secretary of War, Stanton, said to him, let's start sinking British men of war, British naval vessels that were breaking the Union blockade of the Confederacy. Stanton said, let's start sinking these British naval men of war. And Lincoln said, one more at a time, Mr. Stanton, one more at a time. Let's win the Civil War, and then we'll get to the War of 1812. We can't fight 
two wars simultaneously. He was an incrementalist. He counted the cost. I say that it's possible for us to save babies incrementally because the studies show that that works, not to the exclusion of saving all of the babies immediately, as immediately as we possibly can, but in tandem with those two goals. The last point I'm going to make, and then we'll go to questions from the audience. Very, very simple. I'm, I'm deeply troubled at, at what, what Russell projects as a harshness and insensitivity to the lives of these, these babies who are saved by an incremental approach, and then sort of arguing that anybody who supports incrementalism does not support immediatism. That, that, that is simply not true. I'm deeply troubled that Russell has said repeatedly that ultimately his goal is to prosecute post-abortive women as murderers. And he's even gone so far as to intimate that perhaps they should be executed. He quotes from the Old Testament, when blood is shed by someone, it, their blood should be shed also. That doesn't sound to me to be the love of Christ. It doesn't sound to me to be the spirit of Jesus, certainly not the spirit of Abraham Lincoln, who didn't want to abuse the South vindictively. He didn't want reconstruction of the sort that we ended up with that caused even more strife uh, when the Civil War finally ended. Lincoln was forgiving. Jesus is, in, in, I think, is a reflection of the fact that Jesus is forgiving. We need to be forgiving as well. Every woman who aborts knows that abortion is wrong. Every woman who aborts knows that it's wrong but almost none of them know how wrong it actually is because the church is covering up the horror of abortion. We agree on that. And the pro-life movement is covering up the horror of abortion. We agree on that. And that's not going to change until we change the way the pro-life movement does business. And I share probably 80% of your criticisms, the fundraising abuses, the, all of this, other, hiding the horror of abortion. I agree with you on all of that. So I began by saying there is, we agree on more than that on which we disagree, but where we, where we do disagree, I'm just asking that you not mischaracterize my position. I'm both. I'm not one or the other. God bless you for the work you're doing, and thank you. Okay, so we're going to do our question and answer time. I would like there to be a center line formed down the middle here, and I will meet you with a microphone. What I want is for you to direct your question to a particular person, and we're going to allow them to respond first, and then the other person can, can have a minute or two to also respond. Okay? So please specify who you're talking to. Ask your question. Not long speeches, please. Okay. My question is for Greg. Because mediatism is a gospel issue, do you... Or have you ever made people at your gap display sign a waiver that they would not give a gospel answer or a spiritual answer unless they're asked? And is this a denial of the power of the gospel? Well, I, I, I don't have the documents uh, with me and they're constantly evolving. We certainly don't come onto a campus that's a secular school with Jesus pictures. We have Jesus pictures that are scriptural pictures that we display on Christian college campuses. Uh, I've had uh, people come on to uh, our, uh, join our gap display staff and ask if they could hold a Bible and ask if they could preach from the Bible. Don Blythe is an example and we said sure. We do ask that people be discerning on our staff and that they look for opportunities to share the gospel, but we try to let the person approaching us give us some sense of where they want to take the argument rather than we direct it. But if I could finish, almost without exception, I can't think of an exception where we go onto a campus, do we not 
work with the local campus ministry groups on that campus, and the goal is a division of labor so that the people inside our barricades are making social justice arguments unless they see an opening to share the gospel, and then we want them to do that. And the people outside, the campus ministry people outside the barricades are sharing the gospel. We want both those things to happen, and it's a, it's a division of labor thing. And, but having said that, if, if a member, I, I myself uh, will talk about Jesus if I see the slightest opening to do that. And again, guys like Don Blythe, who is a street preacher, who just wants to talk about Jesus, whether people want to hear it or not, we, we let him stand inside the barricades and do that. So it's not an ironclad rule. I, I just answered that question. Yeah, oh, no. Oh, I, I absolutely answered that question. We allow people standing inside the barricade to talk, to talk, to talk about Jesus, to look for opportunities to talk about Jesus. And if they say, well, I want to talk about Jesus, even if the, somebody doesn't seem to be leaning in that direction, we allow them to do that. Okay, thank you. Hey, Russ, uh, do you have a comment? Mine, mine's we real allow short. Them to do that. I get, mine's real short. I get emails and Facebook messages on a very regular basis from people who say, I used to do CBR stuff, but this waiver always didn't sit well with me. I'm so happy that we're unashamed of the gospel and we're fighting abortion. I hear about this waiver on a very regular basis. Okay, thank you. Next question. This question is for Greg. Thanks for being here, sir. Um, my question has to do with your statement of that you are a, um, a spiritual immediatist uh, by nature, but that you are a practical um, uh, you know, um, incrementalist, and you said that because we need to save babies, that's necessary. That seems to me to be like placing 10 leaky buckets inside of each other, thereby leaving you with a leaky bucket. So I wanted to ask you the same question that you asked Russ, the hypothetical. If your child was drowning and you wanted someone to save your child, but the, the most plausible causal effects that you could, based off all the information that you had, were that somewhere in North America, it was going to encourage the drowning of 10 or 100 or 1,000 other babies into a pool who would not have been drowned otherwise. Would you still advocate the rescuing because your job is to save babies? It seems to me that you're assuming that the causal effects are gonna be that no one else will be killed. So your, your analogy seems to argue against your own case rather than what Russell. I do assume that babies' lives will be saved rather than lost. Yeah, I, I assume that babies' lives will be saved rather than lost by our policy. That's why we have the policy. The hypothetical is if the most plausible or logical conclusion would be the drowning of a hundred other babies or a thousand other babies. Would you still save your own grandchild? Or would you say, I can't sign the death warrants of these other kids because my own child is no more valuable or has any more intrinsic value. I'm going to say, let's, let's kill no one. The premise of your question doesn't make sense to me because we can do both working to save the one minute old baby and working to save the 20-week-old baby, we can do both of those things. And working to save the 20-week-old baby does not, does not, I'm rejecting the premise to your question, it does not, in our experience, increase the likelihood of the baby dying uh, at, at a few seconds old. We, we don't think women have abortions, or, or said differently, we don't think women use uh, Plan B because we're working to save 20-week babies. We just reject that just as we reject the contention that we're ashamed of the gospel, Russell, go to our website. The gospel is all over our website. Jesus is all over our website. And I, listen, you guys are entitled to whatever opinions you want. We're entitled to have, have disagreements. Excuse me, tell me. Excuse me, we're entitled to have disagreements about strategy and tactics. Don't say we're ashamed of the gospel. Russ, uh, do you want to respond to his comment? Unfair. Um,
Fair okay, enough. I think we've, we've been enough, over that. Fair enough. For the sake of argument, for the sake of argument, taking a premise with which I totally disagree and accepting it as true, I would agree with Russ. Thank you. Russ, do you want to comment about that question? Uh, I just, I didn't state it as well as I could have, but I actually do think that these incremental bills that are designed to specifically save some do educate the culture in disastrous ways, which do abandon many. And I believe there's tons of evidence for that, and any activist who's out on the streets hears it all the time. Next. This question's for Greg. Thanks for being here again. Appreciate you. Uh, so I wrote it down. Uh, you say uh, earlier, you said that we should make every argument we can, uh, that we can make, Yet in real practice, is it not true that what we see in prolifery is best exemplified in arguments like your 2013 debate with Anne Ferretti of the British Pre uh, Pregnancy Advisory Service, in which you did not call the nation to repent or focus on abortion as sin in the debate? That is to say, that in real world situations, what we see in actual practice among pro-life people is a default to a pragmatic presentation that does not present the gospel as the solution to the sin of abortion, and that, probably wouldn't you say that that's because all those in the pro-life movement can't even agree on what the gospel is or whether it's the answer to abortion? Thank you. Uh, I quite respectfully encourage you, it's a fair question. Look at the debate again. I do call on the nation to repent. I say I'm here because of Jesus. I'm here because I think abortion is a sin. I did both those things. I didn't just do the one or the other. Watch the debate again. In the Q&A, I talk about Jesus. Russ, do you have a comment? I, I just wouldn't put it in the q and don't, I don't wait for the world's permission to share the truth with them. I think that it's that dire of a situation, and the gospel of God is that powerful, that it should be at the forefront and unifying everything that we do. So even if you're arguing science with someone about prenatal development, just, to prove, just, just as part of your argument, while you're doing that, the gospel can be part of it. And um, I think the idea that gospel-centeredness is present in your work because you can cite some point and place where you did share the gospel is, is a mistake for what we mean by gospel-centered. Like, Immediate abolitionism is all the gospel. The go immediatism is just the gospel applied to national sins. Just so everybody knows, the debate was sponsored, the British debate in London was sponsored by our British partners, a group called Christian Concern, with whom we work all the time. Nobody has any doubt in England that we're Christians and that we're yeah. motivated That's by That's what Jesus. I'm saying. Like, that isn't gospel-centeredness. That's sponsored by a church group. Next question. Um, my question is directed primarily to T. Russell Hunter, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but preferably also with comment, if possible, afterwards from Mr. Cunningham. Um, unfortunately, most of the, at least unfortunately from my view, most of the debate was centered on some combination of historical analysis and, and debate with uh, a lot of ad hominem discussion regarding each person's views. Russ made an assertion during one of his points, um, and it's come up a couple times since, it was primarily a theological assertion um, and related to the relationship between um, the passing of laws by a civil government and um, the laws that God has given us, the theological framework we're coming from as Christians. So my question is, um, he said that uh, sin of child sacrifice is the national sin that we have here. Um, the way in which we must deal with that national sin is by national repentance. And then he uh, intimated that passing laws that moderated or regulated um, that sin was akin to not actually repenting as a nation for the sin. And so my question is, can you help me understand your argument for that big assertion, which is a strong assertion? It's not just about the wisdom of immediatism, but your view, the obligation of immediatism, mm -hmm. and then presuming Mr. Cunningham can then say why that's fallacious. Uh, it goes beyond, like, the legal passages of laws. Like, I actually truly believe, not just because I'm trying to be righteous, I actually truly believe that abortion is so prevalent and so demanded and needed that to really 
have it knocked out, not just in a legal sense, but not practiced in this sort of constant, every minute, all the time, demanded, needed, loved, approved, celebrated abortion, to change something that deeply rooted in the culture, we need a revival of true and vital Christianity. And, um, and so anything that you're doing, whether it's a law or writing a pamphlet or holding a sign or having a conversation, has to be sort of like de- into this funnel of this revival. Because I think that revivals precede cultural reformation. Um, and so it's not so much a political statement about theocracy or anything like that as much as, as it is the statement of um, very simple. The nation is sick. The whole head is sick. But we're a nation of churches. We're a nation of religious people. We have everything we want. We fattened our hearts in a day of slaughter. And the only thing that's going to extricate us of this is, you know, tearing our clothes and wailing before God, woe is us, we are wicked, we need your help. If we do not do that, there will be judgment. My analysis of the abolition of slavery in America was such that the abolitionists rose in 1830s and they began calling the nation to repent. And the nation did not repent. The nation said, no, we will end this by increments. And they planned an eventual abolition and God brought war. I want revival. I pray for it all the time. I work for it. I want social justice. It would have been cruel beyond imagining to tell black people, we're going to let you continue to be lynched. We're going to let you continue to be denied voting rights. We're going to let you continue to be denied the right to get on a bus or eat in a restaurant or get a job until there's revival in the country. Revival first. And you can just keep getting brutalized until we've got revival. That's an absurd thing to say. It's a cruel thing to say. We need revival. We need social justice. Let's work for both as quickly and as hard as we possibly can. Thank you. Next question. This is directed to uh, Mr. Cunningham. Do you believe in the infallibility of the Word of God? Yes. The Word of God says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do unrighteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Satan? Or what does a believer have in common with unbelievers? Yes. What an, what agreement is there between the temple of God and the idols? For we are the temple of the living God. <clears throat> so you say that you work with secular, you would work with anybody. This passage says that we cannot do that. So would you not say that what you said earlier was wrong? (laughs) I don't think that passage is speaking to social justice issues. I don't think that passage is speaking, for instance, to to my little girls whom we adopted, my wife and I, from China. They were abandoned on the streets as babies because they had cleft lip and palate. And the surgeons, the cranial facial surgical team that has saved their lives, at least one of their lives would have been lost without that surgery. Those men are not believers. They're not Christian. One is almost certainly an atheistic, secular Jew. The other is a Sikh or a Hindu. I'm not sure which he is. And we're yoked with them. And they're saving our children's lives. And I didn't say to them, unless you become born again, I didn't preach John 3.16 and say, unless you're born again, I'm not going to let you operate on these little girls. And I didn't say to the nurses, I want to know where everybody in this room is spiritually, or the anesthesiologists, or whatever. You're conflating a scripture that talks about marriage and deep spiritual union between two individuals or two groups of people in some profoundly spiritual endeavor. You're, I think you're conflating that with, with something that's, that's not applicable unless you in your own life uh, apply that same standard if it's your child who's going to the doctor or if it's uh, some other life and death sort of situation where, where you would not be associated in any way with somebody who wasn't born again. Um, Brief I response. just respond that it's not just about being associated and again 
uh, letting an atheistic or a Buddhist doctor help your baby. The yoke is the idea that you're like at this thing and you are pulling something together. You are working together on a project, working together on the abolition of human abortion by the gospel of God. Would you yoke yourself with people who deny the gospel of God and sin grievously against him and his law? I say no. You would not yoke yourself to people who hate God. Why? Well, if you're being pragmatic and you want to abolish abortion, you don't got God on your side. You've got You've traded God as a partner for the LGBTQF pro-life secular lobby. So you've done a very unpragmatic thing. Spiritually, I think it's unwise, and I think just sort of if from an intellectual statement, your question is good and valid and solid, and that was just a total sidestep of it. Okay, thank you. Totally. Next question. All right, this question is for both of you, but for the sake of the format, I'll ask Russ because I feel like abolitionists probably get this question more from pro-lifers. And that's, if you had the opportunity, if a bill was presented to you that would abolish abortion completely except for one child, you had to let one child die, there was one exception, what would you do? For the first thing, if someone came and they came into my office, pretending I have an office, <laughs> and they said, okay, an immediatist, we'll see if you're as unloving, as vile as that Greg Cunningham said you are. I will abolish all abortions if you will just let me abolish, uh, abort this one child. All of them. If you will just let me take some scissors, and stab this image bearer of the living God and kill them and snuff out their life. If you let me do that to this one, I will, in your name, abolish all other abortions. I say, get behind me, Satan. I do not make deals with the devil. Okay, thank and you. I rebuke him and send him out. Because Break. if you actually take that deal, maybe it's for 200 and all. Okay. If you actually take that deal, you are compromising. And you might be able to say, I saved lots of babies. But it never bears fruit. Never bears fruit. The history. Greg, do you want to respond to that? No. The answer is quite simply is no. And if I may add, we don't have enough votes to outlaw abortion without the support of people who don't share our point of view. And folks, lots of the people, in fact, I dare say most of the people who supported the legislation that has been documented to save these babies' lives, the incremental legislation, they weren't believers. But I thank God that God used them in their lost, dissolute, pagan state. God used them to save the lives of these babies. Don't be legalists. Don't be Pharisees. Don't care more about the law of man. I mean, this reminds me so much of Jesus going to the temple and the, and, and the Pharisees and the chief priests saying it's the Sabbath. You can't save a life today. It's the Sabbath. Save a life some other day. Wait, do it some other day. Those men cared more about their rules than they cared about people's lives. And Jesus said, no, I'm not waiting. I'm doing it right now because the law of God is paramount to the rules of men. Don't be legalists. Thank you. The, I, would say, I would say get thee behind me, Satan. But I wouldn't go on with some diatribe about these babies' lives not mattering. These babies' lives do matter. Okay, next question. The reason we don't have those votes is because we're not calling people to repent. Next question. Can I only ask one? Okay. Um, okay, my question is for Greg or Mr. Cunningham. Thank you for being here. I know that you're a little bit outnumbered in this room, so I appreciate you being here. Um, my question is, if um, you were able to 
get cognitive assent from a professing atheist that abortion was a human rights violation, do you believe that if they found themselves in a crisis pregnancy, or put themselves in a crisis pregnancy, um, that they would actually act in accordance with that cognitive assent they gave you? Or do you think that without the power of Christ within them to enable them to do all things through him, that they would take the easy, socially approved route and um, in most cases do uh, what was easy instead of what was hard? That's an excellent question and one of the best questions I've heard, not only here, but really in a long time. If I could correct one thing, I honestly do not feel outnumbered. I feel I'm with the saints. I feel that I'm you. I want to stop this atrocity just as intensely as you do. I love Jesus just as much as you do. Whatever differences we have on strategy and tactics, I don't feel like I've come in here in some adversarial setting. I feel your warmth. I feel your love. I'm very comfortable here. I love being here. I'd like to come back again. My wife is a public health nurse who founded and directed some of this country's first crisis pregnancy medical clinics, working with poor women, often women who, who barely spoke English, and a lot of them were unbelievers. And she, she always shared the gospel with them. Some of them rejected the gospel message, but they, saved, they, they said, I'm not going to have an abortion because of the, so, the human justice arguments that my wife also made. So it's possible to change the mind of an atheist who rejects the gospel just on the strength of human rights arguments. But we want to make both sets of arguments. We don't want to just make the one or the other because we don't know which arguments are going to resonate with which people. But my wife can tell you it is possible to change the mind of an atheist and have an atheist mother decide that she's not going to kill her baby because of the social justice influence. So I, Russ, I, respond. I, I, I agree that it's possible to change the mind of an atheist at, and about abortion by human rights arguments and all that kind of stuff. Um, the, the, the real thing that I think is so good about that question, and this is, if you go to abortion mills, 3,500 surgical abortions are not happening every day uh, just by people who already, before they were in that situation, thought abortion was okay. Um, it's people who may be pro-life or pro-choice or undecided who look at that little stick and it says they're pregnant and they think, but it's not my husband's baby who get the abortion. It's a sin thing. It's always a sin thing. Sin rolls down on children and we sacrifice them to cover our sins. And people, like what pro-choicers sometimes say about pro-lifers, that uh, they go get abortions too, I believe is true. We go to abortion mills, we see lots of crosses, lots of Bibles, lots of people quoting scripture to us, and I dare say lots of pro-lifers who, because it wasn't a sin issue and they weren't believers in the gospel, they were false believers, they killed their babies. Next question. We're going to go on. All right. Uh, I, got, I got a practical question. Break the rules and put them all together. I got a little practical question first. To, to get an understanding. You have some legal background. That's okay, good. Abortion was legal in four states for any reason, basically, before Roe v. Wade. There was a few handful that would had, not for any reason you want, but for very limited reasons. And then, um, immediatism happened with Roe v. Wade, and the law is a great educator of people. So my question to you is, this is your legislator. What are the practical, legal things that would immediately end all of abortion? Because as far as I can see, the Supreme Court is like everyone else. They have a belly button, just like their opinions, and theirs stink. So what can we do in the practical sense, if we had all the authority and everyone was convinced to end abortion in a day? Okay. Uh, the enactment of a human life amendment to the United States Constitution explicitly conferring 
rights of personhood on unborn children. Is that the only way? Uh, cer certainly, certainly the most incontrovertible way, the way that would be most difficult to undo at any future time. Russ, do you have a response? I'm a legal scholar, but I do, I think that... Can you repeat that? Someone asked. Uh, to enact a human life amendment to the United States Constitution that explicitly confers rights of personhood on unborn children. Because even the pro-life justices on the court, who are strict constructionists, say that because the Constitution doesn't mention abortion, it's not a constitutional issue, and it would have to be decided by the states. We don't want it to be decided by the states. We want it to be decided by the U.S. Constitution so no state can kill babies. Okay. Um, Russ. Uh, I would say that it, that's probably one of these weird where, places where we end up being like for the same thing. Um, that there would be some kind of way to bring all human beings under the prohibition against murder. Um, that's good. The one thing I would say is that there have been times when we've had pro-life presidents who had pro-life houses and senates and they appointed judges and instead of doing something like that they did something incremental. That's the whole point of what I'm saying. They chose incrementalism instead of immediatism. And so when we have the power and the votes and the ability to do this, we do not do this because of the delusion. Bush is who I was talking about. Bush? Bush had the votes to enact a human life amendment and he chose not to? That's a lie, Russell. Wait, he wait, wait. didn't have the votes. No, no, did George W. Bush ever have the House and the Senate? He didn't have the votes. It takes more than the House and the Senate to, to, to pass a constitutional amendment. Two thirds, okay. two thirds. Okay, so maybe the Republican Party did not have the Senate Russell. and the House and appoint justices. And instead of doing something, he, he did do something with um, embryo research. He did more than that, Russell. Right? He did Russell, do some things. I was in he the Justice Department, Russell. You're talking to the wrong guy now. I was in the U.S. Department of Justice in the office that was responsible right. for, for vetting federal judicial nominees. George Bush and George W. Bush both said, nobody goes to the Hill unless they're certifiably pro-life. And they meant really pro-life, not fake pro-life. Okay, so, we're going to go to the next I question. I just don't think they stood up. They did something else. Uh, Greg, my wife repented of her three abortions after seeing hard truth. I'm very grateful for much of her ministry. Yeah. However, I strongly disagree on many of your arguments. So I want you to answer, if you could, this question in the context of two short paragraphs I want to read from Roe versus Wade, footnote 54, which you may be familiar with, in which the Supreme Court said in a sense that they saw the personhood of a preborn child being undermined by the state of Texas because of the inconsistency in their law, granting exceptions to kill some children, and their failure also, a point that you made about Russell's criticism, or criticized Russell for the punitive uh, sanctions against a woman who committed an abortion. Let me read this and then I'd like you to comment. Two paragraphs, two short paragraphs. When Texas urges that a fetus is entitled to the 14th Amendment protection as a person, it faces a dilemma. Neither in Texas nor in any other state are all abortions prohibited. Despite broad prescription, an exception always exists. The exception contained in Article 1196, abortion procured or attempted by a medical device for the purpose of saving the life of the mother, an exception. This is a person who is not to be deprived of life without due process of law, and if the mother's condition is a sole determinant, Texas exception appears to be out of line with the amendment. There are other, I don't need the mic, there are other inconsistencies between the 14th Amendment status and the typical abortion statute that that Texas that in Texas, the woman is not a principal or an accomplice with respect to an abortion upon her. If the fetus is a person, why is the woman not a principal or an accomplice? Further, the penalty for criminal abortion specified is significantly less than the maximum penalty for the murder prescribed of the Texas Penal Code. Therefore, if the, per if the fetus is a person, may the penal ties be different. So, those two points, 
I'd like you to comment on the first one, and then, Russell, you may want to come on, especially on the second one. These are the two principles, foundational principles, from Roe versus Wade that denounce the personhood because of the exceptions and because of the inconsistency in the penalties. Thank I you. reject the footnotes. I'm a lawyer. I've clerked for judges. The, I, countless footnotes in countless opinions are just totally absurd. I reject them. The fact that it's the basis of Roe versus Wade and or Doe, Doe versus Bolton means absolutely nothing to me. I reject virtually everything in Roe versus Wade and Doe versus Bolton. But let me say one thing. The general, I don't know if he's still here, who asked the question about our waiver has convinced me that we should take that waiver out, completely eliminate it, and we're just going to let people talk about whatever they want to talk about. You didn't know about whether the they're, I'm sorry? So you didn't know about the waiver. I never denied knowing conceptually about the waiver. I said I didn't have it committed to memory. And frankly, okay. excuse, me, excuse me one second. I'd like to address this exception hey folks, idea. Hey, folks. Yeah, let's move off the waiver. Excuse we can do me that in a minute. Second. Take yes for an answer. Instead of a round of applause, which is what I had hoped I would hear, now, now we're getting, what, you didn't know about it? Of course I knew about it. I didn't know what the exact language was, and language matters. And so if there's confusion about this, and I heard Russ say people were suggesting to him that they were troubled by it, then I think maybe we should take it out. We'll just take Russ. it out. Because we're already allowing people, we've always allowed people to talk about Jesus behind the barricade. So it's not a change in policy. It's the removal of something that was confusing to people. That's, that's good. I think so, you should remove the waiver. Are you addressing that yeah. or the question? Uh, uh, the exception thing. Okay, question. I do think that, uh, you know, it's really risky to read long quotes when your presentation because people might not actually follow them. So that's my bad. I apologize. But it's that William Pitt um, thing. If it is injustice, if it is injustice, then of course it ought to be immediately abolished. Like if we're saying it's murder and it's evil, it should be unjust. It should be abolished. The footnote, which tells you about something that very important people believe that are writing footnotes in Supreme Court documents and probably reflects partially what the culture believes, is saying, come on, if we have an exception for abortion, it must be okay given a certain set of uh, criteria and that does open the door fully and completely. If abortion is okay in one instance, it's okay in all instances. Thank okay, you. Russell. That allows next, it to go. Next question. Ru excuse me one second. William Pitt, whom Russell just quoted favorably, was an unbeliever. Unbeliever with whom William Wilberforce was so closely yoked that Wilberforce admitted repeatedly Almost everything he accomplished in Parliament was made possible by his association with William Pitt, yeah. who okay. was not a believer. I, I, have, Next to, I have to address. Not, I just have to address it. No, man, William Pitt was not a believer. Sorry, Chris. And they did work hand in glove. Eventually, William Pitt went over to Dundas and supported the gradual abolition, and it broke up their okay. friendship. Next quite question. A bit. All right, uh, Greg. Uh, True you, fact. Greg, you Greg seem to it. have a um, dare I say binary view of uh, secular and sacred arguments. So uh, I guess my question is, would you say that there is, or there can be a moral obligation grounded in something other than the Christian God, or unlike children falling into swimming pools, do you think that this is a conflict of worldviews? It's absolutely a conflict of worldviews, and that's why we appeal to people who embrace both worldviews, we're trying to create a political consensus to outlaw abortion. And so we speak Greek to the Greeks, and we speak Roman to the Romans, because we're trying to put together a political coalition. If you go to our website, this is something that really, I gotta admit, I'm getting a little steamed about this. You go to our website, Jesus is all over the website. The idea that I'm sort of ashamed of the gospel, or ashamed of Jesus, or we hide Jesus, that's not fair, it's not true, it's not accurate. This is a clash of worldviews. Absolutely correct, a clash of worldviews. But it is possible to convince somebody who has human justice concerns that abortion should be against the law on human rights grounds. Russ. 
If I'm given 20 minutes or 15 minutes or 10 minutes or 5 minutes to talk about how to abolish abortion, I will bring up Jesus in my presentation right out the bat. Not only after when someone brings that into consideration. Um, the, the situation is not everybody has to become a Christian for us to get the broad political um, consent to pass an, uh, an amendment, a human life amendment. Not everyone has to become Christian. What happens is that the culture undergoes revolu uh, uh, revivals and the growth and spread of true and vital Christianity does salt the earth and dispel darkness. And even in a community where not everybody's Christian, if the church is being salt and light, it will help people, believers and unbelievers alike. So we can, we can actually pass an abolitionist bill even in the event that the culture doesn't all become saved. Okay. We're going to do this question and then one more. Okay. My question is directed to Russell. In the case of the rape exception bill, if we make a bill that basically says that if they won't kill these babies, we'll let them kill the babies that were conceived in rape, is the blood of those babies that are aborted on our heads, regardless of how many babies the bill saves? No. I mean, you haven't... One, someone's put forward this fake deal to delude you and keep you from saving all the babies. So... They're so concerned about the people of God being advocates for all human beings that they offer up these distractions and so on and so forth. When you say, stand up and say, I will not vote for Mitt Romney because he's pledged to not do anything about abortion, he's got a rape exception, all that kind of stuff, and the pro-lifer turns around and says, well, those babies who would have been saved if he were president are on your head, they're making an emotional argument, and they're trying to frame themselves in, a, in, in sort of like the heroes that are doing the best that they can. But what's really going on there is you're just saying, I will not legislate which babies will be killed. I will not say that it's okay to murder a child because his father was a criminal. Okay. What you could do is actually oppose that bill and support something better. There are... There, are, there have been 200-something bills by pro-lifers that you can't support, but there Greg, have been some ahead, that you Greg. can. Uh, Russell is fond of saying it's not, we don't believe all or nothing. Yes, he does. He believes all or nothing because these human life amendments, these, these, uh, these personhood amendments are nothing because they haven't been, they're not the law anywhere. They get defeated everywhere. So the stuff he's talking about, it, better stuff, you ought to support that. It doesn't get enacted. And where it does get enacted, the courts instantly invalidate it. This is what gets enacted. This is what saves babies' lives. Dr. Michael knew. We're going to put it on our website. I want everybody here to read it. He documents the, the, the babies whose lives have been saved by the incremental legislation that Russ condemns, I care about those babies, God cares about those babies, and you ought to care about them too. The reason that an amendment like that doesn't get passed is because everyone's focusing Russ, on your increments. we're going to go to the next question. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you guys both for your time and effort in this. Um, so the way I hear the debate breaking down is um, Greg is talking about like what we can get away with politically. Russ is complaining, like uh, protesting the those increments because he sees the messaging, right, that's being communicated to the culture. He's not necessarily proposing a bill right here. He's talking about messaging, right? My question has to do with actually separation of powers um, and, and your opinion on the legal obligation of the legislature. Um, if the Supreme Court is out of line and is making unjust rulings, what is the legislature's appropriate response? Um, and I guess I would compare it to like, if, if the Supreme Court ruled that rape was permissible, should the legislature begin trying to work within that framework and passing bills that said, well, we, we're gonna limit rape to only, you know, I don't know, I don't even wanna make an analogy for fear of bringing it down, but, but regulating the rape 
Or should they be messaging and saying to the Supreme Court, you have no right to make that ruling, and we, as statesmen, are going to stand up and continue making bills that waste your time because is, this is wickedness and unjust. Do you, do you think the legislature has a responsibility to bow to the, the bench or that the legislature should fight the bench? Uh, I, I, as a legislator, spent my whole career fighting the bench. I didn't bow to the bench at all. But you misstated my position. My position isn't that we should, we should get what we can get away with. My position is we should get what we can get away with while we're working to get it all. We ought to do both of those things. Not this binary, we gotta do the one or we gotta do the other. We should be doing both of those things. And, and yes, the Senate, if the Senate uh, were filled with people who uh, were um, respectful of the right to life, whether they were secularists or, or believers, we would be getting judicial nominees appointed, to the, appointed and confirmed to the federal bench all three levels that would be respecters of human life. That's the real, this is a political problem at its root, and all political problems have a very powerful spiritual dimension. That's why we're trying to change the way pastors are trained, so we can mobilize the church to fight child sacrifice. And when we're talking to secularists, we talk about abortion as genocide. And when we're talking to believers who are sitting on their butts, all the criticisms that Russ has, I agree with. Christians aren't doing enough. We talk to them about abortion as child sacrifice. Can I clarify and follow up with this? What legislation has you supported labor and money for its That is, you're saying not either or. Which one is the absolutist legislation that you have actually The human life amendment that was, it was proposed repeatedly, and I, for all I know it's still being introduced, but it really had a shot in the, in the 1980s. I was actively involved in promoting that. Russ, do you want to respond? Do you have anything to say? Well, to I, add? I, do you agree that most of the pro-life movement opposes that sort of like effort towards like putting funding, putting effort into a human life amendment like that, or as opposed to? Well, are you talking about a personhood amendment or a human life amendment? Um, either one, whichever one you think. Okay. Will well, the personhood is getting shot down everywhere that it's tried. Either the, either the initiatives don't get on the ballot or they get defeated, or as happened in Missouri and as happened in Kansas, the, the, the personhood people were compromisers. And they said personhood doesn't go into effect unless the Supreme Court basically overrules Roe versus Wade. So it was a sham. It looked like a personhood amendment, but in reality it changed nothing. Yeah. I, I would... Uh, I would prefer a bill of abolition, abolishing human abortion as murder in the United States of America, and political minds should put that together. I will say, uh, I agree with some of the sentiments about um, different kinds of sham, even sham personhood bills, but about messaging, when I sponsored a personhood amendment initiative in the state of Oklahoma, along with Dan Skirbit and Keith Mason and those guys, when we were going around asking for signatures, talking to people about it, and when we were in the Capitol, in the rotunda, you know, talking about this personhood initiative amendment, we could not get support because the incrementalists kept on telling us that it wasn't the right time, we didn't have the votes, it would get shot down, we're going to put our faith and trust in this personhood bill. They called it a personhood bill which didn't have the same teeth. It wasn't an amendment to the Oklahoma Constitution. That is an important lesson, and it's the thread that I keep on coming back to. There is a reason that people are not calling and expecting or believing or working on the absolutist bill or the, the abolition of human abortion. It's because they're doing both. But they're not actually doing both. They're saying, I agree with that, but not now. It must be later. The time for justice is always later with these people. And the rise of the immediatists in this country isn't just because of AHA. It's because people have been schooled for the past 40 years with 
one after another of these pro-life incremental laws having either no effect or the wrong effect. And people are emailing and saying, wow, I thought you guys were crazy and mean and just saying a bunch of stuff, but Frank Pavone is now supporting okay, anesthesia Russ. for babies? It's turning around. People are getting sick of the incrementalism, and then we'll be able to pass these so bills. So stop Thank saying you. later. Let's save all the babies we can now, Russell. Amen. That's on you, my brother. I agree. Okay, we are done. Thank you all for coming. Let's thank our speakers. Yeah. Sorry. Good.